session. And, um, and so the results that we're presenting here is uh, actually uh, a collaboration, very fruitful and, 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 and very fruitful and productive collaboration with uh, Vili Moylenberg and his group in Eulish. So, um, Vili, are you ready to go over there? Uh, yes. Let me so, see. Can you see my uh, slide? Yes, beautiful lake. <laughs> yeah, that's our canteen, but it uh, doesn't matter. It looks very beautiful. <laughs> So yeah, uh, thank you first for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for the technical help. And uh, yeah, welcome to the audience. It's a great pleasure for me to give this presentation today. And um, the focus of my presentation today uh, is on ion conductors, uh, but I will also tell you something about uh, ceramic uh, porous membranes. And uh, yeah, hopefully I will not bore you and I will do my best, but I will not show today uh, electrolysis because then I could give uh, a completely uh, different talk. So I will concentrate today on membranes for gas separation and for membrane reactors. And uh, I start uh, with a very simple, let me see, yeah. So uh, in principle, in industry, uh, membranes are already used in a lot of different fields. And all what is above one man nanometer in pore size is currently commercial available for a lot of separation methods for separation of blood cells, bacterial or bacteria, viruses, or proteins. And all what is below one nanometer, that is under development. And you see here that we also have at zero nanometer the so-called dense membranes. And that is the focus of my talk today. That means the, uh, the separation is not by a molecular sieving, uh, but it's done by ionic conduction. And here uh, you see also the, the kinetic diameter of different gases, and that shows you uh, that we are somewhere in the area of uh, pore sizes in this range if we want to separate gases. But first of all, uh, let's start very easily. Uh, so in principle, uh, if you look to the de definition, a membrane is a separation layer uh, which enables the separation of two fractions. And you know this from your household when you separate spaghetti from the water. But there is also here a nice uh, uh, other uh, explanation. So the fraction for separation, you have first a, a larger and a smaller fraction. And uh, this fraction is given to the sieve, and that is called feed. And then there is a separation. Uh, so that means uh, the small particles permeate through the membrane. And that's a permeate. And uh, what is uh, back from the membrane, that's called retentate. And that is, in principle, the easiest way of separation. And uh, if you now uh, look to membranes, what is existing in the world, uh, I show you uh, only uh, two. Where are we working here on in Jülich? That are the so-called uh, silica-based membranes. This membrane works very well for the separation of different gases, and they are called microporous membranes. But the name is completely wrong because first of all, we do not have pores here. We have, because we have a free volume in the lattice, of, in the crystal lattice. In this case, it's an amorphous network, and this free volume has a size uh, far below one nanometer, which enables, for example, hydrogen to pass this uh, free volume and other gas molecules, which are larger, cannot pass uh, this uh, free volume. So they are separated. Uh, another possibility is the so-called graphene membranes. Uh, they are structurally a little bit different. You have different layers and the size between the layers, so the free space here is also in the range uh, below nanom one nanometer where, for example, hydrogen can pass and other, other gases not. And if you look to the microstructure of this uh, same in image, image here, you see a membrane which has a size of only 100 uh, nanometers or 200 nanometers and uh, all the other things you see here are intermediate layers or porous uh, support layers. That means uh, we have a graded structure here. We start with a pore size at the support of maybe 100 nanometer, and then we have 
uh, decrease, we decrease the pore size in the intermediate layers and the functional layer, which you can see here is only, uh, has only a, a, a so-called pore size uh, of uh, yeah, 0.2 or 0.3 nanometer. And there are under, uh, also other membrane possibilities, for example, the so-called Maxine membranes that are titan uh, carbon uh, membranes but that is still on a TRL level uh, below uh, very low. So, uh, but maybe for the future, that's a very interesting membrane. The major, major disadvantage of uh, this membranes is the stability uh, of the left ones is the stability, for example, in humid conditions. And that's the reason why they incorporate here also the carbon bonds into the SEO2 uh, layers. Typical application and this uh, applications uh, last year we didn't have in our focus, but currently in Germany, uh, they're talking about hydrogen economy and uh, two separations are very interesting for the sporous things. One is the separation of uh, hydrogen from CH4 because they uh, think about to transport uh, the hydrogen in the methane uh, pipelines. Uh, up to 10 to 15 percent, but then at the end user, you have to separate it again. For a microporous membrane, that is not easy because the membranes normally operate very well at temperatures of 150 to 200 degrees C, but this separation has to take place at 8 to 18 degrees C, and that is yeah, very difficult for such a kind of membrane. Uh, much easier is the separation of uh, a hydrogen from a liquid organic hydrogen carrier. Also here, the idea is uh, to absorb the hydrogen in this carrier. And then uh, when you need it in a fuel station, for example, you have to separate it again. And here we have uh, very high pressures and uh, temperatures above 150 degrees to 200 degrees C. And that is an, uh, in principle, very nice working condition for such a kind of membrane. But now I will switch to the main part of my presentation to the so-called uh, ionic conductors. And my focus is today on mixed ionic electronic conductors. So if you look to a membrane, which is used in an electrolysis, you have only ionic conduction, and then you have an outer circuit, uh, which in principle is also the driving force for the diffusion of the uh, ions uh, through the membrane. But if you have an, a mixed ionic electronic conductor, your driving force is the gradient of partial pressure uh, of the gas, which is permeating on both sides. And here we have uh, two different applications. One is a pure uh, gas supply. And uh, so that means from a gas mixture, we uh, separate the oxygen or hydrogen or also the CO2 that uh, later Sabrina will show you in the next talk. And uh, one possible application, for example, in a, a industrial uh, field is the so-called oxyfuel combustion in, uh, in different industries. And so that means you combust here your fuel with pure oxygen that ensures that your flue gas contains uh, a very clean CO2 gas stream, which you can catch. So it's a, a kind of a CO2 capture. The difference of a, a normal membrane module and a membrane reactor is that in a membrane reactor, you have on one or both sides of the membrane, in addition, a chemical reaction. And you can use um, also here the same membranes uh, and the application is CO2 utilization, uh, but also the production of chemical energy carriers or commodity uh, chemicals. There are also some environmental applications. And when we start uh, to look to this membrane reactors, uh, we made a literature study. And here you can see uh, um, which applications in principle you can find in literature uh, for such a membrane. But that means not, that's only what we found. That means not that all these separations uh, make sense. The green boxes uh, uh, use, is a so-called proton conductor. That means here the H plus, the hydrogen uh, is transported. And in the blue boxes, you have a so-called oxygen transport membrane where the oxygen ions are transported. And as mentioned, uh, if you have a mixed conductor, uh, the charge compensation is done in the membrane by electronic conduction. But there are also some uh, uh, applications where you need pure conductors. And one, for example, is a, a pure ionic conductor is the ammonia synthesis. 
uh, because here the temperature is so low uh, that the driving force is not high enough to make any separation at low temperatures with a mixed conductor. So, and uh, I want to show you two uh, of this uh, application possibilities, not because they are the most important, but they are uh, the most easiest to explain. And we have two different uh, uh, function uh, of the membrane here. One is a partial oxidation of methane that if we have a methane, we produce a syngas. And the other is the so-called water gas shift reaction. Here we have a syngas and we separate hydrogen from this water gas shift reaction. And here you see this uh, two uh, reactors. So on the left side, uh, the catalytic partial oxidation of methane. You have the membrane uh, in the middle where an electron ion uh, is uh, transported in this direction, the oxygen ion in the other direction. Here you have air. Uh, you split the oxygen into an oxygen ion and an electron, uh, uh, an oxygen ion, sorry. And then uh, in principle, uh, you transport the oxygen to the other direction and then the oxygen electron is released and transported back. And then you make here from the CH4, a so-called syngas, which contains CO, H2, CO2, and also water. And that is called distributor concept because the oxygen is di distributed uh, to the other side, to the reactant. On the other side, uh, on the right side, you see a so-called extractor concept because here you have the syngas and the hydrogen uh, is extracted from this gas and transported to the other side of the membrane. And you can uh, generate here pure hydrogen. And the big difference between the gas side and the, the porous membranes is that if your membrane is idle, ideal, uh, you have in principle a separation of nearly 100% if you have no defects in the membrane. Now uh, to uh, the program in Jülich where we are working on. So in Jülich we have at least uh, 6,000 people working here and uh, nearly 1,000 are working in the energy field. And the IAK, the Institute of Energy and Climate Research where we have more than 1,000 co-workers is split it into 15 different uh, uh, independent uh, part institutes. And here you see how we, uh, how we work. So I'm working in the IAK1. We are uh, experts in material synthesis and component manufacturing. Our colleagues from the IEK2, they are destroying everything. That means they make the fracture mechanics and also the thermodynamical uh, assessment of the membranes and uh, also of the sealants. And our IEK14 and our ZAA1 are the departments which uh, in principle design our stacks or modules and with op which operates them. And then uh, also we have some uh, fundamental institutes like our central department of chemistry, which can uh, uh, look what happens uh, in uh, the membrane uh, uh, during operation and after operation. And uh, we have also a system analysis group, which lo looks to the life cycle assessment here. So here uh, you see the, the, the uh, in principle, the microstructure of a so-called uh, hydrogen transport membrane that's the ionic conductor. On the left side, for example, uh, uh, a lanternum tungstate uh, substituted with molybdenum. At high temperatures, we have here a mixed conducting property. That means we have proton conduction and also electron conduction. And this hydrogen transport membrane has always also oxygen conductions. And you have to take care here that you have the partial pressure in the right direction. Otherwise you produce water and not pure hydrogen. You have also classical materials like barium circonate, serrate mixtures, and also it is an option uh, if you want to have uh, other properties uh, to mix it with oxygen conductors, for example, with sergadolinium oxide. And sergadolinium oxide is a material which has on high temperature and reducing atmospheres also um, an electronic conductivity. And uh, for example, also here in a fuel cell arrangement of ammonia conduction, uh, ammonia uh, separation, you have also some uh, yeah, mixtures with uh, nickel and pure ionic conductors. Also the oxygen conductors uh, look similar. The membrane is, has a thickness of uh, 20 uh, to 30 uh, 
micrometers and how it is manufactured. I will show you later. Uh, classical materials are uh, lanthanum strontium uh, cobaltite, the perovskite material you know also from uh, the cathode in an SOFC. A material with a lower flux, but a, but a high uh, stability is the strontium titanate based ferrite. Uh, but uh, you have to dope it uh, with other elements to get a good conduction here. And also dual phase membranes are a possibility in this kind, uh, for example, uh, iron cobaltite, so that's a spinel mixed with sergold aluminum oxide, and then you have an ionic conducting phase and an electronic conducting phase. That are the different options. Now, uh, how we uh, produce or manufacture uh, these membranes and which material is the best one. So there is no best material because before you start the material selection, uh, you have to look in which environment, that means in which application uh, you want to operate the membrane. And then you, you need some properties. You need a high ionic and electronic conductivity. You have to be stable in the aggressive environment of your membrane reactor on both sides. And uh, the, the materials must be adjusted to each other. That means they need a thermal and mechanical stability in the complete arrangement. They must be com compatible and uh, it should also be a low, low cost material. Uh, after uh, you selected the, the material, uh, then you, you make a thin film because the transport is uh, much higher if you have a thin film. I will show you later the, uh, the transport equation. Uh, you need also uh, porous catalytic layers on both sides. First for uh, the, the generation of the oxygen ions or the hydrogen ions, but also maybe you need a catalyst for the reaction which is desired. And uh, you need a porous support for the mechanical stability and it must be porous to guarantee the gas transport to the membrane. Once we have uh, realized such an asymmetric structure on a 50 millimeter size, we have to upscale and then we have to build uh, to manufacture small components and uh, these components should be tested then in a membrane reactor. And that's the microstructure, for example, of an asymmetric oxygen transport membrane. That means you have the porous support, you have two catalytic layers on both sides, and you have the membrane material. And often the membrane material is uh, itself a catalytic layer. Uh, that means uh, you can use also the same uh, material for the oxygen uh, generation uh, on both sides. So that's not the reaction catalyst. So uh, yeah, how we produce now such a microstructure and there are hundreds of different ways uh, to make this uh, microstructures. Uh, but one uh, we are using uh, is for example, tape casting. Uh, you see here, you have in principle a slurry container uh, and then you have a small gap and a so-called doctor blade and you have a polymeric foul. foul. This polymeric foil is, um, has a constant velocity in this direction. And then in principle, the cer ceramic slurry flows on the top of this uh, carrier and it is transported in this direction so that we can uh, code a continuous uh, layer of this membrane. And in the past, what we did first, we make the porous support. And then in addition, uh, we made by screen printing an additional layer on it, the membrane layer. But you can see what happens here. If we have a defect in our porous support, uh, our yeah, thin membrane has also a defect and then we cannot use it anymore. So for this reason, we decided to make uh, everything with uh, tape casting, the so-called sequential tape casting. And we coat the membrane layer first on the polymeric carrier because then it has a perfect surface. And in the second step, we coated the porous support on top of it. And then we made a co-firing and we get the device. And here you see, for example, uh, such microstructures. We have a very thin membrane. We have a uh, porous support of a size of up to 500 micrometer. And by this, uh, we can coat uh, stable cells of 10 by 10 or also larger uh, diameters uh, or uh, sizes. And um, yeah, and now the question is, uh, how good is the flux in, the, in such a, a thin film membrane? 
So and when we started a few years ago, uh, we made a first uh, thin supported membrane of under 20 meter in size. Uh, we have also a pressed bulk sample of 1000 micrometers and uh, we had also a bulk sample of 300 micrometer. And then we was very disappointed because our bulk sample of 300 micrometers has a much uh, better performance in oxygen uh, flux than the thin film. And um, I will show you later uh, why, uh, that, uh, why that happens. That is a so-called polarization effect. You have a porous support, so oxygen is permeating very fast. But if uh, the nitrogen cannot pass away, very fast uh, from the surface of the membrane, you get a so-called polarization effect. That means uh, the, grade, the partial pressure of the oxygen is going down and then your driving force is killed. And for this reason, you have a very uh, bad uh, performance here. And when you optimize the structure in your support and not in the thin film, you can, uh, in principle, we have here a factor of 10 more in oxygen flux then, for example, on the left side uh, with a thin film membrane. And if you uh, look for uh, scientific reasons, how is the performance in pure oxygen, you can see that you can reach fluxes up to 60, 70 milliliters per square centimeter in minute uh, with such a, a membrane material. That is this case, it's a so-called BSCF, a barium strontium iron cobaltite. That is uh, the material with the highest flux, but unfortunately, the stability in CO2 containing atmospheres is really not very good, so that we have to search for alternatives which work, works better than this barium containing uh, material. And uh, in the, uh, I will show you now the influence of the support. Uh, so um, we see here three different materials, the high flux BSCF, the, the intermediate flux LSCF, lanthanum strontium iron cobaltite, and a low flux uh, strontium iron. Uh, and they have all a similar microstructure. And if we measure then the performance here in this graph, you see that at high temperature, the performance of all materials, and it doesn't matter which material it is, is the same. On low fluxes or on low temperatures, uh, as, uh, the BSCF is the best one and, and then the others. And the reason for this is uh, if you have a, a structure with a porous support, uh, an active layer and also a membrane layer, uh, the, the, the speed of your reaction is always limited by the weakest, uh, yeah, by the weak, weakest layer. And in this case, the transport to the thin film is so fast that the limit is the poor support and the polarization. And that's the reason why here all fluxes at high temperature for oxygen transport membranes are the same. For a hydrogen conduction membrane, uh, it, look, it would look uh, very different because here the flux is a fa factor of 10 lower. Uh, and here uh, the membrane layer is the limiting step and not uh, the, uh, the support. And so uh, the, the polarization uh, depends on the thickness of the layer, on the open porosity, on the pore diameter, also on tortosity, and uh, last but not least, on the gas species. And then we made a model, and you see here uh, the different uh, transport properties. So in the support, uh, you have, in principle, uh, yeah, a gas phase, and you can uh, model the transport of the oxygen by a binary friction model. In the membrane, I mentioned uh, the Wagner equation uh, is depending on the oxygen flux. And you can see if you increase the temperature or if you reduce the thickness of the membrane that you can uh, reduce, uh, that you can increase the flux and that uh, the driving force is a gradient on the partial pressure of both sides. And uh, yeah, if you look now deeper into this model, you see here the porosity in a support uh, and uh, the pore diameters. And what this uh, permeation measurements show is uh, that we have pore sizes uh, below uh, 10 nanometer, uh, up to uh, 10 uh, micrometer, that we have then less polarization effects. And also that the, uh, the, the the, uh, the thickness of the membrane plays a role. You can see it here. That means we need thin supports with pore sizes uh, uh, below 
uh, above 10 micrometers. Our membranes have pore sizes from three to five micrometer. Uh, but if they are larger, then we have another problem uh, with the gas tightness maybe of our thin film, which has only a thickness of 10 to 20 micrometer. And also it plays a role in which direction uh, your membrane is. Uh, uh, is it on the feed side or on the permeate side? The, the relative flux is also limited by the totosity of the pores. And uh, what you can see here, that's a model, um, that's an experiment our colleagues from DTU did, uh, that U-shaped pores in the support uh, and the surface of the membrane would be perfect. And then uh, we made a, a different approach uh, in 2017. We thought, oh, maybe we can make our uh, tailor the, the porosity in our support by, by a so-called freeze casting step. Uh, that means our uh, liquid uh, is here uh, water-based. Uh, we freeze it down uh, to under um, zero degree C when we cast it. And then the ice crystals which are formed uh, are evaporated uh, uh, after the drying step. And then uh, in principle, we create, create everywhere their pores where we had before our ice crystals. And uh, you see here such a structure that was the first structure we ge generated. And you see here a very high open porosity, but op uh, unfortunately not on the surface of the membrane. And when we made uh, the measurement of fluxes, you see that uh, the flux is very similar to our uh, tape casted pores. And the reason is that we have here uh, in principle large pores on the surface, but there where it is needed on the membrane, the pore size was not sufficient. And uh, one uh, option uh, to, to make it better is to have a low, uh, a higher, a lower, sorry, a lower freezing speed. Then you get, uh, create larger pores and then you can in principle uh, influence uh, um, the structure of this uh, crystals. And that is what you see here, that's the pore size over the complete uh, Y uh, coordinate. And you see here in the tape casted membrane, it's very similar, but in the, uh, in the freeze casted, you here see that uh, the pore size is uh, decreasing uh, uh, up to the surface of the membrane. Yeah, and that is in principle the optimized structure but unfortunately, the fracture mechanics of these tape casted membranes are not so good as tape casted membranes. So that we decided then, after trying this, to stay uh, with our manufacturing uh, with tape casting. So now you have manufactured your green body, the graded structure, so the membrane layer and the support. And then the next step is sintering. And that's a video made by a project partner, Kwati Leonard from Kyushu in Japan, was in our lab. And he made some tests and the video shows you during sintering what happens with the membrane. So first the support is shrinking, uh, the, the layer is shrinking, then you have uh, uh, the, in principle the, the bending in this direction. And then after the thin film is uh, already sintered, the support is shrinking, and then you have a bending in the other direction. And in the ideal case, in the final sintering state, you have a flat membrane. So now uh, you get such microstructures, that's all possible, also gas tight, what we measure with the so-called helium leak test. And then the next step is to upscale from 15 millimeters uh, up to 10 centimeters. And then you think, oh, it's easy. I defined all parameters and then I use uh, for everything the same parameters. And that is what is coming out then. You see uh, the membrane is completely destroyed. And uh, the reason for this is uh, if we have a larger area, we have to wait, we have to be very careful in the low temperature area because uh, first uh, we have to remove from our green body uh, the solvents. And in the second step, we have also to remove uh, all the organic components. And that is done at 400 degrees C. That means if we go for a larger size of a membrane, we have to be very carefully and very slow in this low temperature area up to 400 degrees C. And then at higher temperature, we can sinter faster and uh, increasing the temperature faster. And if you do this, you end up with a very nice 10 centimeter cell. And that shows you that upscaling is uh, often not so easy and you cannot use the same parameter for a large cell 
than for a small cell. And that is the reason what you see in the graph here. The next step is then to build a stack. And that is what we did in a European project, which I coordinated. Uh, the stack was in principle very nice, but we have a lot of problems with the ceiling uh, here in this stack. And uh, so, and that's the reason why we go today for a different design. But here, this membrane was very nice because it was built for an absolute pressure difference of five up to five bars. And we manufacture it by tape casting and laminating. That means in a laminating step, uh, we formed such a layer and then we cut it uh, on both sides the membrane. And then we see we have your gas channels that's completely porous in the middle and the surface has a gas tight layer. So, and yeah, now two slides to materials uh, in principle. Uh, you have to choose which materials you want to take, and then you can go for a material which has a very high flux, like a strontium carbon iron uh, material, or you can go for a material which has a high stability and a low flux. That's both not the optimal way. That means you try uh, to find other materials with higher stability and higher permeation. LSCF, LSCF is a very good compromise if your uh, environment is not too reducing. Uh, but then the second question is, what is uh, if we have some sulfur in our gas, then you need other materials. And for this reason, uh, STF has not the highest flux, but it's a very stable material. And the first stack we want to build with a very stable material. And for this reason, that will be uh, our first uh, try when we build up our stack. Another uh, option uh, for a very stable material is a composite, for example, a dual phase membrane. And that's what I mentioned already in the beginning. So we can use here, for example, a sergadolinium oxide mixed with the iron cobalt spinel. And then you can also ensure that you have an electronic and an iron iron conductor and the time is over so my last slide and that is what we planned in 2014 we will build a first membrane reactor based on the SOFC design what we modified a little bit um, the cells are round because it makes it much easier to seal them and that uh, next month so hopefully it will be our first uh, try uh, to show in such a reactor um, that the partial oxidation of methane works. And uh, hopefully next year I can report nice results here. And let's see if we are successful or not. And if not, where are the problems? Yeah, last but not least, uh, one uh, project uh, we have running uh, on the right side, uh, we have the so-called amazing project running. Uh, we collaborate here with a few companies. Uh, HTE is a daughter company from uh, HTE from BASF and uh, WZR is uh, an additive manufacturer. So the idea is to show also that we can manufacture this membranes with additive manufacture and uh, we want to make a material which is able uh, to be used in the ethylene synthesis. That means uh, from ethane, we want to suck away a hydrogen and then we create on one side ethylene uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, we create hydrogen. And that will be a reactor, which we also built uh, hopefully uh, very soon uh, in this project at BASF. And then we want to test our membranes here. And my time is uh, up. Uh, last but not least, I want to show you also uh, one project with, which are in the planning. The idea is uh, how we can uh, generate uh, hydrogen by water splitting. And the idea is here to use from a thermal reactor, a solar thermal reactor, where temperatures of 1000 to 1500 degrees C are available. And the, uh, the question is, can we operate in this environment a membrane because we need the heat for the diffusion, we don't need uh, the outer circuit. And uh, the question is then can we generate by water splitting here by such a, a reactor uh, uh, hydrogen and that is coordinated uh, then hopefully by our colleagues from DLR. Yeah, that's all. I hope it was not boring for you. And I'm also in time because we started a little bit later and uh, I will open now for discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Vili, for this very nice presentation. Um, a comprehensive overview of the activities that your group is carrying in the last year. So it's very, very interesting to see all the developments and uh, um, I'll be glad to, to open the session for questions. Any, any comments or questions for, for this presentation this morning? I'll be happy to handle if you have online questions. I have a first one, Vili. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, do you have the temperature profile of the sintering, the sintering short movie that you showed us? You showed the movie all the way from the beginning of the sintering? Yeah. To cool down? Or that was only up to high temperature? That was only the heating uh, because um, uh, what I said, if you have a graded structure, you have a support and a dense layer on the top. And also, if you have the same material, the dense layer is shrinking first because uh, the, the particles are connected much closer to each other. And when the, the upper layer is shrinking, uh, you have a direct, the bending in this direction. And then if the layer is gas tight, uh, it cannot shrink anymore, but then the support is shrinking. And that's what I said. Then you have a bending in the other direction. And then at one temperature, uh, uh, also you have uh, maybe a little bit liquid phase on it. And then you have a flat membrane. But that was only the heating. There was no cooling uh, in this. And uh, yeah, the heating rate uh, and the final sintering temperature, and you know this very well, is always depending on the material and on the microstructure. Uh, so for each material, we have to find a new sintering profile. Okay, no, sure. Thanks. Okay. Andre, and we have another question here from the audience. Unfortunately, Vili, I cannot move the camera around. Hi, Vili. Uh, my name Hi. is Andre. Hi. I have a question about the asy asy asymmetric membranes. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you have uh, ever made or thought about doing like more than two layers, so you can have a gradual change from a very porous support and, and, the, and the thick membrane and the, the, the dense uh, thin membrane, I mean. If you can have like two or three layers or a gradual interface between the, the porous layer and the, and the dense membrane, you can have a, a more porous uh, support. Yeah, that's right. But uh, and that's the reason why we uh, go for this sequential tape casting, because here we start not with the supports, we start with the dense film. So we coat the dense film on the polymer uh, um, support. And then on top, it doesn't also matter if we have larger pores on it. Because if uh, because the, the, the dense layer is already uh, made. Uh, but uh, I agree, if you have a graded structure, it makes it much easier, but also then you have on the surface of the membrane, if the pores are too small, we have again this polarization effect. So we have always to find a compromise of a, of a, a gas tight layer and without defects and with a support with less polarization. And also here, you cannot say the pores are large, then it is a problem for the membrane. If the pores are too small, it's a, it's a problem of the gas support. So we always have to find this compromise. So also if the modeling shows you want to have a larger pores than 10 microns, it's not easy to realize because if the size of the membrane is only 10 microns and we have three 10 micron pores, then we will fail, yeah? At least you need the factor of three or four uh, to, to get a, a gas type membrane in size. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Vili, just very curious about this, um, this sequential tape casting of uh, this um, inside channels that you've built up. Mm -hmm. So I, I've missed something there. So you basically yeah. make a, a lamination step. Mm -hmm. But how, how, how do you get the channels inside? Uh, yeah, uh, that uh, in the, indeed, I didn't uh, talk about it. So uh, what we use is uh, we need, um, we, we use a material. In, in our case, we uh, use uh, rice starch, which we evaporate it. And everywhere where you have rice starch, after evaporation, you have a pore. And uh, if we have enough rice starch in it, uh, in the porous support, we can uh, 
get up to 40% open porosity. But you can also use other materials, everything what you uh, can uh, take out uh, in the sintering process or in another step uh, can create the pores. Uh, and that can be larger pores, smaller pores, uh, cubic pores, at least if you use a salt. So you can, in principle, uh, make it with this uh, kind of pore filler. And, and thanks for asking it, because I forget it completely in my presentation. So, so you're basically controlling the morphology of the pores yeah. By, yeah. The, by the initial structure of your pore former, right? That's right, yes. And by the content, by the, uh, uh, the, the morphology, and by the, uh, yeah, the particle size of the, uh, of the uh, pore filler. OK. OK, any other questions, comments? Final one. Do you guys have any methane to products project going on? Not only uh, sim gas, uh, this, this partial, this amazing project, I don't know, maybe it's yeah. touching that. In the amazing project, the idea is uh, to make from ethane in principle ethylene. And that is uh, um, in principle what we test now at, uh, our, uh, at the companies. And I can, cannot tell you too much about the reactor because the companies don't, do not want it. <laughs> but uh, we are now, we have now delivered the first samples. And uh, in the evening today, we start our project meeting. And then hopefully I will some, see some nice results from our colleagues from BISF and HDE because they tested our first membranes. But in the current state, state I cannot tell uh, too much about the results here. But uh, I think we are going in the right direction. If it works, we will see. So, but you're going from ethylene to? No, we starting with methane, esane. To ethylene. And then we want to produce ethylene okay. and we okay. suck away the hydrogen. That means on the other side, we create hydrogen. That's the idea. And now we make a kind of proof of concept. Uh, okay. So we will show now it works or it works not. And hopefully it works from the theory. It looks nice. But you know, uh, the practical application sometimes is different than the theory. Yeah. And that we want to test now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Wish you good luck with your new project then. So Thanks. very interesting because this is basically what we are pursuing here as well as one yeah. of the... Target so I, I guess uh, the production of um, uh, chemical energy carriers or synthetic fuels with a membrane reactor is much more the, the, the interested, most interested field uh, currently for this uh, membranes. And, and also hydrogen, uh, the separation of hydrogen, which is also an energy carrier, uh, is a very interesting uh, application here. Yeah. And uh, Sabrina will show you later that we have also completely different options, uh, which are on the TRL lower. But if it works, it could be also a very interesting topic for the future uh, to make from CO2. Again, later, uh, we need, need it as raw material and then to make from CO2 again, uh, methane. And if we have renewable energies, that makes sense. If you not have not renewable energies, it makes no sense because then you waste uh, your energy but uh, you know germany is going to a lot of renewables and then it makes sense to reuse the co2 again sure yeah yeah that makes sense so you only make sense if you have the so-called green electrons right yes right yeah okay Dili. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, you i know you have a busy day uh, end of the day for you ahead still so uh, I thank you very much again to accept our invitation and to give us this very, very nice talk. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank and you very much for my side. Hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much. Let's see you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Vili. So, um, in control of everything here. On, uh, so our, our, next, our next presentation this morning will be given by Sabrina Carvalho. Sabrina, please. Uh, 
Thank you. Got a presentation on. Okay. So thank you very much, Sabrina. Is that okay? Yes. Try again. How can I change the, the slide? Okay. <laughs> Hello, good morning. I'm Sabrina. And today uh, I'm a postdoc at Project 10. And I will present our experimental setup for gas permeation uh, through ceramic membranes. So uh, the Project 10 is responsible for developing composite ceramic membranes for CO2 separation. And before I present our experiment setup for permeation, I will briefly explain what is this uh, membrane and how it works. So we have here uh, a sketch of the membrane. It consists of um, porous ceramic matrix that conducts ox oxygen ion that is represented here by this light gray. And this porous membrane is infiltrated by a molten carbonate, a tech mixture of molten carbonate. So what is the separation mechanism? I have a, we have a surface reaction between the CO2 from the feed side with oxygen ions that uh, comes to, from the, uh, the ceramic matrix. This reaction form uh, carbonate ions, which are percolated through the molten carbonate phase to the other side of the membrane, where the reverse reaction occurs releasing CO2 on the permeated side and uh, the oxygen ions that go back to the ceramic phase to start the reaction again. So the driving force of this, uh, of this mechanism is the partial pressure of the difference of the partial pressure of CO2 on each side of the membrane. And uh, for this reaction to occur, it's important that the flow of carbonate ion be balanced by a counter flow of oxygen ions. So the conductivity of both phases needs to be compatible. So the goal of the project is to produce membranes for CO2 permeation with uh, an enhancing efficiency. So far, we have produced those membranes by isostatic cold pressing, followed by conventional sintering and followed by flash sintering. And we also prepared those membranes by tape casting and freeze drying that Professor Villarreal show you how, how it works, the process. And after obtaining this, those porous membrane, we perform the infiltration with molten carbonate. And those are some of the analysis techniques that we perform on those samples. We have a chromatic density to uh, analyze the porosity of the samples, the porous matrix. We perform uh, scanning electron microscope images to analyze the pore structure and to analyze the percolation of this molten carbonate. We did uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy to analyze the conductivity of both phases. And last but not least, the permeation measurement. So we can 
calculate the efficiency of the, this uh, composite membrane. So this is a schematic diagram of this gas permeation setup. It's almost, uh, uh, it's missing here just the coolant system that we have for the metal connections. So we are using now three types of gases, uh, CO2 and argon as feed gases. We uh, use a mixture of these two gases uh, to start the, the reaction and nitrogen as sweep gas. Those gases are inserted in a three atmosphere chamber by a mass flow controlled by an MKS instrument. Um, and the gas, the permeated gas is analyzed by a mass spectrometer. This is a picture of the system. On top here, we have this three atmosphere chamber that is positioned inside the furnace. The furnace here is open. This part uh, on the front goes in up in, in the, the membrane reactor. And below we have the furnace controller and the MKS instrument. This is the mass spectrometer that we are using. So we need to perform a calibration uh, measurement before uh, the permeation. So we need to uh, inject in the system the gas mixture that we are going to analyze it. And we need to, to insert in a um, proportion that is known. So we can check if the, the, the mass spectrometer is reading what's the error of the measurement. So injecting this flow rate, and we expect to read this proportion of gases. And those, uh, the, those are the values that we read. It's really close for each other. The error were uh, below 2%. And this error can be associated both to the uh, mass spectrometer, but also to the mass flow. Because we don't know which one is, but it's uh, a really small error. This is the three atmosphere chamber that we are using. Um, it is consists of uh, two alumina tubes that is uh, of same diameter that is represented here by this dark uh, yellow. And a third alumina tube that has a larger diameter that surrounds these other two. The gas tight is uh, done by these metal connections that are cooled with water. The membrane is positioned between these two alumina tubes of same diameter. We have a, a, ceramic, a small ceramic tube that injects the gas close to the membrane, the sweep gas and the feed gas. And we control the temperature of, we can measure the temperature of the membrane with thermocouple that are located close to the sample on both sides. So, this is a picture of the this membrane, this three atmosphere chamber. We have uh, this larger diameter ceramic tube. In the left is uh, the sweep side of the membrane where we uh, attach the membrane. This ceramic membrane is attached to this uh, permeated side. We use a ceramic uh, sealant that is composed of uh, aluminum oxide, titanium dioxide, and calcium oxide is a mixture of these three oxides. And uh, the permeated gas uh, goes to the mass spectrometer, and the retentate can uh, be released uh, to the atmosphere. The, the retentate gas can live by this outlet, or it also can escape by this uh, junction, this uh, connection between the membrane and the ceramic tube because we do not use the sealant in both, uh, in both sides of this tube because it's not, we cannot put the, the membrane inside if we connect to the two sides. It just uh, seal to the permeated. This is a picture of some parts of the, the membrane. Picture one and two represents the, the side where we connect the membrane. The membrane, we cannot see very well, but it's in here inside this plastic bag because the process of uh, the sealant needs to, to be in a humidity atmosphere for one day. So we put a little bit of water 
inside this plastic bag and leave it there for one day. In picture two, we can see the, the gas inlet and the thermocouple. And the, in three and four is the uh, connections in the feed side, the gas, uh, the ceramic tube for the gas and the thermocouple. So before the first permeation test, we did a leakage test. This picture shows a uh, dense alumina uh, membrane that is uh, positioned in this ceramic tube of the membrane reactor. We use uh, CO2 and argon as feed gas and the uh, nitrogen as feed gas at this flow rate, 100 milliliters per minute. And these are the results that we obtain from the mass spectrometer. We uh, perform on those three temperatures, 550 degrees C, 610, and 665 degrees C. And there is a small increase in the leakage with temperature. It's important to note that here we have no permeation. This is only a dense uh, alumina membrane. There's no um, carbonate here. So we have these values for those, the gas flux of CO2 and argon for these three different temperatures. And it is interesting to notice that although we inserted the same amount of CO2 and argon to the system, they do not leak at the same proportion. And this is important because we need to know the argon uh, content. We use the argon content to calculate the leakage of CO2. So we need to know the proportion of each one, because this is the way that we can calculate the permeated CO2. So this, uh, the rate, the ratio between CO2 and argon, it's close to 0.84. It's not one to one, how would be expected by the feed gas. And we got uh, close to 7% leakage on the, during the experiment. So for the permeation test, we use the same feed gas, sweep gas and flow rate as we use for the uh, leakage test. This picture shows the membrane produced by tape casting that we produced in Eulish. Uh, uh, the membrane here is uh, with the sealant before the curing process and here is after the curing process. Um, and these all are the gas content that we got from the mass spectrometer. The curve, the, the look of the curve is really different of the uh, leakage test. Um, the permeation, the measurement started before uh, the melting point of the carbonate that was 500 degrees C. So we didn't, we only expect permeation after, after 500 that is around this temperature where we have uh, increase in CO2 and in argon. And it is important to measure before permeation because we need to check again the proportion of uh, CO2 and argon that are leaking from the system. And when the temperature reaches uh, temperatures above 500, we check, we can see an increase in CO2 that we expect for the permeation, but we also see an increase in argon. So when uh, the carbonate got uh, liquid, we got an increase in uh, the leakage. So that happened because we checked, we verified that was a small um, reaction between the sealant and the carbonate. So part of this carbonate was absorbed by the sealant and uh, react a little bit. This was the increase of uh, leakage because we have more pores available on the sample. But we also uh, see that with time, we have um, a decrease in leakage. These this periods uh, in colors is isothermal. So we, I, here is 600 degrees C for a while. And there was a decrease in, in leakage. And we believe that this, this is kind of a self-healing of the sealant because part of the carbonate is going to the to the ceramic uh, sealant and is somehow uh, closing some pores that was there. So 
we got uh, those numbers for the street temperature uh, that we measure. This first one is important because we need the proportion and uh, we use the ratio between CO2 and argon to calculate how much of CO2 was leaking. This ratio is uh, multiplied by the content of uh, argon and by the flow rate. And we get the total CO2 uh, measured minus this CO2 leakage, and we got the CO2 permeation. And those values are uh, shown in this figure. So here is when the, the system uh, reached temperatures above 500 degrees C. So the, the carbonate is melted. And uh, we can see that with increase of temperature, we got an increase of permeation. There is a small decrease in the permeation is possible due to possibly is due to the interaction between the carbonated and sealant. And at 700 degrees C, uh, we got a CO2 flux uh, of 0 0.4, 428 milliliters per minute per square meter when we consider the size of active area of the membrane. And if we consider the driving force of the system, that is the uh, partial pressure of CO2 on each side of the, of the membrane, we got 7.24 uh, times 10 to minus 8 mole per square meter per uh, second Pascal. So this is not the best value that we got on the literature, but is close to some values that were reported. This is our first test. We still have some problems with the sealant, but is better than some uh, values that we can find on literature with the same feed gas, because it's important because the uh, amount of CO2 that we inject can uh, influence this, this proportion. And uh, so the next, activity, the next activity that we are planning is to improve the ceiling to reduce this gas leakage and uh, increase the permeation. We want also to use different atmosphere at feed side to simulate uh, real situations for CO2 separation and use impedance spectroscopy and the permeation measurements to find uh, the composition with the best permeation results. I would like to thank the, our team of, at Project 10. Uh, a special thank to Willy Mellenberg to uh, where I could prepare those membranes by tape testing, freeze drying, and for everyone here. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for this nice talk. Session is open for comments and questions. We have one down there. First, congratulations. You have uh, done an incredible presentation, right? And, and the question that I had is, why use nitrogen as a sweep gas in all your experiments? Why not use a a stabler gas because, well, nitrogen could with oxygen, right? Why not use another one? We checked if there was a reaction, this, this process, there was not a reaction, and this was the gas that we have available. So if it, it was okay in the moment, that was the one that we used. Not a specific, I don't need nitrogen specific for this experiment, but it was available, it was, it was working, so. That's what we use. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any, Andre? No. Okay. If you have any, you have a question. Sabrina, thank you. Uh, just a curiosity about your ceiling. Uh, is a commercial one or is a homemade uh, it, formula? It's a, a homemade slash commercial. This was the same that I used in English. Uh, over there was commercial, but I took the proportion of these uh, oxides and prepare here. So that's it. Any other comments? 
Um, I have one. So what is the next step for improving the ceiling? I'm studying what I can use. I saw that uh, the interaction is that is forming uh, lithium, alum lithium aluminate, maybe, I don't know the name, is lithium with alumina. So maybe to, if I get to use another oxide than alumina in the system, I can uh, have a better result. Or maybe seek for a uh, glass that I can put and replace it. But uh, I, that's it. I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to do. I'm still researching. But you could detect that actually your molten carbonate is reacting with the sealant, right? Yes. That, that's the point. Yes, yeah. it's the molten carbonate. That's why you see some lithium, aluminate, whatever. Yes, formed. yes. An option is to use a, a eutect mixture of other uh, carbonate without lithium, because uh, in the XRD was the lithium that reacts. I don't know if we remove the lithium, we will still absorb the, this molten carbonate, but it's an option also. Okay, let's thank again, Sabrina. Thank you very much. We, we move to the next presentation. This is gonna be an uh, online presentation. Um, Sergio, Sergio Damasceno will Fabio. present. Sergio, can you share your screen with us? Okay. Can you hear me? Well, yes, very good. Can you see my screen? We see your screen, and now the presentation model is pretty fine. Okay. So, can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's working good. Sergio you can go on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Serge Damasceno. I am a PhD student at Federal University of ABC. And my research project is related to Project 12. And today I'm gonna to present a, a part of my PhD thesis that is related to the effect of lanthanum doping on serial fluoride structure and the relation with transport properties. I work under supervision of uh, Professor Andrea Ferlauti. So, the aim of our division methane to products is to use methane as a raw material uh, due to the increased availability of methane uh, in several sources such as natural gas and biogas and uh, the possibility to production of hydro hydrocarbons. The production of hydrocarbons allows the carbon assimilation and the products and intermediate of interest to the industry. One possible route uh, for methane conversion is the direct conversion of methane through the oxidative copy of methane uh, to produce ethane and ethylene at high temperatures over a metal oxide catalyst. The oxidative copy of methane, the OCM reaction, has some prerequisites for industrial feas feasibility, such as a C2 selectivity uh, higher than 8%, and a C2 yield higher than 30%. In the, in the literature, some catalysts are reported, reported, such as the manganese and magnesium oxides, whereas the doping of the system with, with lithium showed the, showed the best performance. However, at the awesome temperature, the lithium compound is volatile, and uh, therefore this is an unstable material for awesome conditions. Moreover, Doped and undoped hair earth oxides, uh, sodium tungstate, doped with manganese and perovskites, have been reported as catalysts for OCM. Uh, the system where Syria, Syria is doped with lanthanum has shown some uh, good activity for OCM with a complex relation between defect chemistry, crystalline structure, and physical properties. The topping with lantern uh, produces reactive oxygen holes centers uh, at the vacancies, and the lantern has a basicity trend that makes this material suitable for OCM reactions. Uh, the system where serum is doped, uh, seria is doped with lantern, 
has a superior thermal stability compared to the pure oxides. It has a high oxygen storage capacity, and this system allows the turning of oxygen mobility uh, that is related to the ionic conductivity. And this reaction can be performed in the low temperature region. Well, regarding the crystalline structure, cerium has a cubic, a cubic fluoride type and lanthanum a hexagonal A type. Uh, the doping with lanthanum uh, create oxygen vacancies and the higher doping with lanthanum increase the oxygen vacancy concentration. This increase leads to the uh, rearrangement of the atoms with uh, in, uh, induced changes in the ideal fluoride structure. It causes a dubbing of the unit cell forming a C-type phase. Therefore, the C-type uh, phase is a distortion of the fluorite one. In the C-type phase, the oxygen vacants and the cations undergo ordering and uh, the lattice parameter is the double of the fluoride structure. This change uh, or this for the formation of this biphasic system has some implication on the oxygen mobility that is directly related to the ionic conductivity. Therefore, the aim of the, this part of my project is to correlate the transport property, that is the ionic conductivity, and the structural change on the fluoride structure, such as the increase uh, the defect chemistry and the emergence of a C-type phase. Well, in the development of lanthanum doped serif pellets for the electrochemical measurements, uh, first the precursor powder uh, was synthesized by a combustion road uh, and the lanthanum content was varied from zero to 70% to 70 atomic percent. After the powder obtention, this material was dried and uniaxially pressed for obtention of the green ceramic bodies that were sintered at uh, 1,500 degrees for five, five hours. At the end of the sintering process, this material has the density determined by the Archimedes uh, method to evaluate the densification process. Uh, in the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy experiment, uh, which was performance for 100 to 650 degrees with a step of 50 degrees. First, the electrode was patterned with silver ink. The system was heated and the stabilization time of 30 minutes was performed. Uh, therefore, the electrochemical measurements was carried out. And at the end, the data was treated with, with the ZVU software. Well, our first analysis was the evaluation of the density. And uh, to evaluate this, the densification process, the final density was compared to the theoretical values, values obtained by heat veil refinement and values reported in the literature. As you can observe, the density follows a decreasing trend with the increasing of the lanthanum doping for the theoretical values. And uh, for the sintered uh, lanthanum doped pellets, the density follows a different trend. This occurs due to the different content of lanthanum in this structure. For instance, the cerium, uh, the pure ser uh, pellet has a density around 8%. And this is occurred due to the low mass diffusion in the system during the sintering process. The low vacancy concentration hinders the oxygen ion mobility. With the incorporation of lanthanum, the mass diffusion process is uh, improved and we achieve higher densifications, as you can see here, uh, the relative densifications. The 70% uh, doped uh, sample could not be determined because it is unstable in water and in air. Well, the pellets were characterized by X-ray diffraction uh, for phase identification. E, and uh, it can be observed that from zero, uh, from pure ser to 50 atomic percent, uh, the diffractogram display of refractions corresponds to the cubic fluoride structure of pure seria. 
For the samples with 60 and 70%, we can see new reflections in the structure. And we have two hypotheses for these new reflections. Uh, the precipitation of lantanum and the formation, the possible or the possible formation of a biphasic material composed of a disordered fluoride structure and a C-type phase. Uh, this uh, new reflection, new phase is under investigation uh, using different uh, crystallographic information files to identify this system. Uh, as we can see uh, in the uh, zoom of the one-on-one -on -one reflection, there is a, a shift for lower angles, uh, which indicates the lantern incorporation on the fluoride structure. Uh, indeed, when we analyze the lattice parameter with the increase of lantern incorporation, we see an increase in the lattice parameter. And there is a linear correlation up to 50%, which indicates that up to 50%, the system follows the Vergard's law. Above this value, there is the precipitation of uh, uh, lantanum or the formation of new phase. Uh, in the literature, some solubility limit around 60% and 50% is important. And these differences arise from the different synthesis methods and the different heat treatments. X-ray diffraction is uh, a tool to phase identification, but the short range uh, order cannot be identified. Uh, Roman spectroscopy in turn uh, is an interesting tool that can provide insights on the structural chains, whereas the short range order can be detected by lattice vibrations and the uh, serifluoride cubic structure has a high symmetry uh, with a main vibrational mode about the unit cell center uh, related to F2G symmetry. As you can see for other samples, this F2G mode is present and this increase with the, uh, there is an increase of the asymmetry with the increase of lantanum uh, doping. This is that is related to the decrease of the symmetry of this system. We performed a Hamon fitting using the Kaza XPS software to identify the different bands that arise uh, with the lantanum doping. As you can see, there is a transversal optical mode around the 264. And that is arise from the symmetry reduction with the lantern doping. The C type phase emergence with the uh, increase of oxygen vacancy concentration. And we have bands related to the defects, uh, oxygen defects. Moreover, there, there is a, a, a new mode uh, related to the splitting of the F2G mode at the 408 that is related to the non-equivalent bonds. Well, as we can see, the C-type and transversal optical mode, they became significant above 30% due to increase of oxygen vacancy concentration and the decrease of the symmetry. Moreover, the bands related to defects uh, increase its intensity with the doping level. Uh, in a quantitative analysis, uh, by the fitting, we can see the F2G position has a, a red shift due to lantern incorporation, and the full width at half maximum uh, increase with the lantern doping, and it's correlated to the decrease of crystallite size that leads to a disturbing of lattice periodicity. We can see that the relative intensities of the defect bands increase uh, with the lantern doping. Due to the incorporation, of, due, to, due to the creation of oxygen vacancy in the system. Finally, we obtained the, we performed the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy experiments, and we can see that uh, the uh, the several components, the bulk, gain boundary, and the electrode, and we can see that the bulk contribution is smaller for the smaller concentrations, and it increase uh, from the from higher concentrations. And uh, in 
the Buki contribution is uh, it dominates the overall conducting process. We use it, uh, the ZBU software to perform the uh, modeling using equivalent circuits, and we can see and we obtain the conductivity for the several for the different components. We can see that the conductivity increase for five to twenty percent. And it, it is related to the increase of oxygen vacancies concentration. And above 30%, the, con, uh, the conductivity decrease due to electrostatic and steric interaction between dopant and vacants that lead to clusters formations, and it decreases the ionic mobility. Moreover, the C-type emergence, as we saw in the Raman spectra, uh, decreases the oxygen uh, anion mobility. We prepare the Arrhenius plot for obtention of the activation energy, and uh, we can observe that the, uh, the activation energy represents the energy for the energy barrier for oxygen anion mobility, uh, and it can be used to indicate whether the, condu the conductivity is electronic with the activation energy close to 0 0.5 electron volts, or if the conduction is ionic, close to one electron volt. As we can see, uh, from zero to 20%, the total activation energy has a mixed contribution of electronic and ionic contribution. And uh, uh, Above 30%, it's uh, composed in by mainly by the ionic conductivity. Well, some authors mentioned that uh, a fast release of oxygen species in OSM reaction leads to methanol complete oxidation. So the next step of our experiments is correlate this uh, activation energy barrier with the catalytic experimental. Uh, analysis to evaluate if uh, a higher conductivity or a smaller conductivity is better for OCM performance. Well, so we can conclude that uh, there is a direct relation between defect chemistry, crystalline structure, and ionic conductivity. The increase in lantern concentration increased the ionic conductivity up to 20%. And uh, above that, the ionic mobility is hindered due to the increase of oxygen vacancy concentration and the emergence of the C-type phase. The future experiments consist of uh, polishing and chemical etching of the serial pellets for a same analysis. The electrochemical impedance spectroscopy measurements in different oxygen partial pressures and the OCM reaction to evaluate the effect of ionic mobility in catal catalytic performance. And in the next se section, Fabiani Tindad will present the preliminary results uh, of OCM reactions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, I had to rush. Thank you very much, Sergio, for your presentation. Session is open for questions, comments, online and here in the seminar room. Sergio, I have a question for you. Very quick, okay. if you could get back to the impedance diagrams. Well, do you have an idea of the relaxation frequency when you call it the 30% lanthanum sample? You attribute okay. that to bulk. Yes. So do you have an idea of the capacitance of at least four of the, this relaxation frequency? Yes, I, I determined that this is a book due to the capacitance around 10 uh, minus 11. Oh, minus it 11, was, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, and it's interesting because there was... Even for the 40, 15, 6 person, the capacitance was around 11, 12. Okay. Already. Okay. And what is the temperature range that you have measured the 
Uh, your heinous plots. Yeah, this is very low temperature. Yeah, this is at 107 degrees, and we perform it from 100 to 60, 650. 100 to 600. Okay, thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. This is very well detailed read, um, analysis of this solid solution between Lanthanum and Syria. It will be very interesting yeah. to correlate transport and catalysis afterwards. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, this is an interesting uh, tool because some authors, as I mentioned, some authors report that the fast oxygen release that is in the range of 0 to 20% is correlated to methane overoxidation. So we want to understand this whole net, uh, if this oxygen yeah, mobility. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the point. I think I think maybe the next presentation will give us some light in, in that direction yeah, as well. <laughs> it's okay. a all over. Okay. Any 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 comments, questions? If not, Sergio, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. We we move to the next presenter, Fabiani. Please, could you come? Be given by Dr. Fabiani Trindade. Okay, how would you like? This is the pointer, this is the next. Okay. 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 So, good morning, everyone. My name is Diane. I've been working on Project 12 as a researcher. And today I'm going to present my results on tuning of shape, defects, and disorder in lanthanum doped serial nanoparticles for oxidative coupling of methane. So this work was developed uh, by me, Sergio, Bria, Daniel, Fabio, and André. We are based on Federal University of ABC. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce the methane, in, the methane scenario so the main challenge and why it's so important to designing catalysts, the methodology, the results, the conclusion perspectives. So besides all the, all the environmental problems and the instability of petroleum prices have brought back the interest in indirect methane conversion, especially in oxidative coupling of methane. That is basically methane that converts methane directly in S-lane. So OCM have been studied since in the eights. And then the last few years here, so we start to increase in study in this direct conversion by OCM. And then a big number of uh, catalysts have been studied with different composition, but it is still a challenge to, to find out a catalyst that is stable and have good activity, selectivity, and then that will produce a yield bigger than 30%. Because this is important to commercialize it, the industry just have economical interesting yields above this. So that's why the, all the, this challenge and then why it's so difficult to convert methane in its lane is that methane is a very high stable molecule. 
Ethylene is a petrochemical commodity whose the price depends on the raw material supply and demand. So it's really important to find out another road to produce ethylene. So this is a, this scan is this example of the OCM reaction in a surface metal oxy catalyst. And then first of all, the methane activation involves the abstraction of the hydrogen atom to form the methyl radicals. And these methyl radicals are coupled in a gas phase reaction to form ethane. And then finally, the hydrogen H to form ethylene and then the subproducts CO and CO2. This, the literature report uh, many kinetical mechanisms, but it is, uh, it, there is a strong evidence this mechanism is by Marston Kravlin. This mechanism is the oxide lattice. Uh, they still in a redox, uh, in a redox reaction cycle. Uh, I can list here several challenges involved in this reaction. And then the, the biggest challenge of this reaction is because the, from the thermodynamic point of view, the production of CO and, and uh, CO2 and CO is more favorable than to form ethane and ethylene. This is why, because this, this first step here, this abstraction of the hydrogen of the methane molecule is very important. And these methyl radicals have to be protected to form ethylene and not over oxidate and to form CO and CO2. Uh, so to overcoming all these challenges, our proposal here is to design a new class of catalysts. So this is the methodology that we use to produce our catalysts is based on Syria doped lanthanum. Uh, and then just by simple changing the temperature, we could control the morphology, nano rods and nano cubes. And then to control and then tuning the oxygen vacancies, we doped with lanthanum. So why lanthanum? Lanthanum is, has a, a different valence than cereal. And then also there is a good basicity that is really important for OCME reaction. This is, a, this is the two series of, of uh, nanoparticles that we produce it. So we doped these nanoparticles from 5% to, to 90%. And then we used the methodologies to produce nanorods that we synthesize it by 110 degrees. And then we use the methodology synthesize it at 108 degrees to produce nanocubes. With more in details, we can see here, when we, we, we increase in the doping concentration of lanthanum, we can see the nanorods organize themselves in an oriented attachment mechanism. And then from the cubes is very interesting, up to 10%, they start to form rods. And then this rods also is organized by the oriented attachment mechanism, but in a, in a, in a particles smaller than the series of 110 degree. So even for high doping concentrations, it's interesting here for the 110 degree series, there is no secondary phase formed, but we can notice here the increase in the lattice parameter that, that, that is, is, is result of a disordered effective fluorid phase. And then for the series of 180 degrees, after 20%, a secondary phase was founded. And then this can be related by the, by the by model morphology, because we have cubes and then mix of cubes and the nano rods. And then also, the, the interatomic distance. So the, the Raman spectroscopy is a very good technique to, to characterize it, the effects and the oxygen vacancies. So here in, in also we can see the cubic fluoride are maintained. And then the 
F2G that is, is related to the cubic fluoride, there is a shift to lower, uh, to, to lower frequency that also, that, uh, there is also is another evidence of the defect cubic fluoride. And then by increasing the lanthanum doping concentration, we could see here that the oxygen vacancy is increasing. And then by analyzing better this, this uh, Raman spectra and then relate the, the, uh, the ratios of F2G and the, the defects, we could see that, uh, that there, there is a, um, in, in for the 100 series, for the 110 degree series, we can see, we can see a, a, a line that is come up different for the, for the, for the series of 800 degree. And then also is important to point here, this uh, two, methodolo two, two methodologies was the same, just the difference was the temperature. And then as we can see here, the amount of oxygen vacancies was different. And then why this is important? So we prepared all these catalysts, we tuned it, we got different properties. And then it's important thing is our main goal to test day. So this is our experimental setup to test the OCME reaction. And we use methanol and oxygen as a reactant diluted in aerial. So, and then these gases are mixtured and then passed through the, through the reactor under 700, 750 degree. And then the other the, the products and subproducts are analyzed by by a line mass spectrometer. And then it's important also to point here we got a, a timing of a stream a twenty hour of the reaction. Uh, here is the is, is a really nice result that we got that we could see how these how these oxygen vacancies and how this distortion on the microstructure of the fluoride was important to tune also the conversion and especially in the selectivity. Uh, for, the, for the samples here, 40% with 40% of doping concentration and 50% of doping concentration, we can see a double, the selectivity is a double. And this is why we, we believe this is because of the appearance of the C-type structure that maybe could be important to, to improve the selectivity and also the amount of oxygen vacancies. Uh, another interesting result is to compare how the, how the synthesis temperature will affect it in the OCM performance. And then here we can see for the samples synthesized at 100, 110 degree, and the sample synthesized by eight, uh, 108 degree. And we can see the conversion and then consequently the yield was different, but the selectivity was nearly the same. And then we believe in this for this result, also the, the, the amount of oxygen vacancies. And the double phase, the double fluoride phase, phase that we found it here, uh, maybe it would be a problem for the conversion. And then this, this, this results we still investigated better. And then this is just our first thoughts about, about this. So another important result in catalysis and the all reactions in heterogeneous catalysis is to see if the if the catalyst will maintain the microstructure and the vacancies after 20 hours of a reaction at seven, 750 degree. So as we can see here for the XRD and the Roman, we didn't have a considerable chance for for these catalysts. And then this is the evidence that this catalyst could be a promising for, for, the, for this reaction because they are very stable. So we, we still want to improve 
the, uh, the selectivity and the activity of, of OCME reaction. So that's why we're still looking for, for new catalysts and the, our brilliant student, Bria Caesar, she is studying also the different morphologies and, and then co-doping this lantano doped Syria. She is co-doping with estrogen and the estrogen and iron. So she's preparing nanocubes nano by a road that we use the hepatic solvent like urea that will improve a lot the, the, the mono dispersion of the nanocubes. And then also another interesting morphology that, that we, could, uh, we could develop in this work is not using the, the, the base, the strong base. And then we develop this, this kind of morphology that is none of ours. We just use the, the pure aesthetic solvent here, the real. So also we can see here differences in the oxygen vacancies, the distortion, and then we, we will start to study better these results and then also perform the OCM tests. So for summarizing here, my talking is that the, our key achievements is to tune these this catalysts by, by increasing the amount of the vacancies. And then uh, these vacancies was really important to, to the OCM reaction especially for the selectivity. And then Lontano also have a really good, good deal in this. And then also the stability during the re redox cycling, because in these uh, in this results, uh, we could not see the catalyst decreasing in, in efficiency. That is really important. So we had the 20 hours and after 20 hours, our catalyst is still Good with it, with a good microstructure. So I would like to to present some perspectives of our work. We 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 are planning to send a proposal to the Canadian Light Source because to study more, study better, and, and get to know about the mechanism of OCM. We need to know the local the local disorder. So PDF measurements will give us a clue about this. And then also we are, we are working and then still talking for the collaborations with the Sirius, with Christiane to do also PDF and then with Itamar Nekel to do the Bragg CDA that we, we can see the strain and then how this microstructure changed after the, the, the bonds. So I would like to thank you my colleagues from from Laming, from UFABC, and then all the agencies, all the support that we have to do this work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fabiani. Uh, session is open for questions, comments. We have an online question. Hi, Fabio. Hi, Fabiani. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, congrats, Fabian, for the nice presentation. I'd like to come back to your methodology to, the est uh, to estimate the vacancies, the oxygen vacancies. Could you repeat this? This is not uh, quite clear for me. How have you estimated the vacancy concentration? Okay, this is right. Is it right? Okay. So here we controlling the 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 uh, the oxygen vacancies by doping the Syria with lantano in different concentrations. So we dop it with 5%, 10%, 20%, 4%, 50%, 60 until 70%. So for the Siri of 110 degree, we could maintain the, the microstructure. So uh, we could maintain the fluoride microstructure. Otherwise for the series synthesized at 8, 
uh, 180 degrees. Uh, a secondary phase, phase after 20% was founded. So this is this is why why the uh, the two series got different different amount of the cases because the local order in this uh, in the microstructure is different. Okay, okay. so uh, you didn't Maybe. estimate, uh, you, you didn't measure, direct, direct measure the, the amount of vacancies actually. So have you uh, tried, uh, have you tried to do for instance CPR measurements to, to give a, a, a real, a natural number? Of the vacancies? Yep. Okay. Because as far but, as uh, as far as I have understood in your presentation, you have an estimation of this uh, the, the, the this vacancies by uh, given by the doping, the doping of the, the the serum doping, but you don't have a number. You don't have a, a, an actual measurement of this vacancy concentration. So uh, you can do this using EPR. Have you tried, or are you planning yes. to do this in EPR? Yes, we are planning to do this. Like we. We have two new postdoctors, uh, Daniele and then Jimmy. Daniele, she's a specialist in EP EPR. So she will help us to study this, this the, to determine the quantification of the amount of the vacancies. Yes, we're planning. So there, there is a few studies in the literature that show that it's possible. Also, it's important to study by, by EPR is the superoxide and the peroxide that they are, they are fundamental in the OxyMU reaction. Thank you, thank you so much. Kawe, the, the defect band, uh, this D1 and D2, they are, they are a very good indication of the amount of uh, vacancies. You cannot give a number, it's, but they are proportional, so you can see at least the, the Okay, and, but uh, do you have at least uh, uh, an estimative of this number? Is that, uh, I mean, 1%, 2% of the total oxygen, or is that totally arbitrary? Well, I mean, if you if you consider the, the charge balance, uh, it would be like uh, the X, like, uh, would be like for the 50%, would be lanthanum, cerium, and oxygen will be 1.75, uh, right? Okay. So, I mean, assuming that uh, we have the charge balance. Of course, there are okay. other effects, but that's, that's the amount. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kawe. Any other comments, questions? I have a quick one, your catalysis. <laughs> your catalysis data, you're basically comparing same doping, different morphologies. This is the one. Right, so this is the fifty percent. Was the classical composition for for the OCM, and uh, yeah, okay. So you basically see a difference in selectivity, and that's you attribute to the increased oxygen vacancies, right? So how deep Raman spectroscopy probes your system, your particles, Which way? and the light interaction with your powder. So th this would be like I we like uh, we like how I said we we have to know the amount of the superoxide and the peroxide. I think this would be different here, and then also is important to point in the series of eight hundred uh, one hundred eight degree. There is two phases, two fluoride two, two fluoride phases with different Lattice parameter. They still fluoride, but they got different lattice parameter. So this may, this is the this is the image in the, the surface. Maybe maybe the oxygen mobility because of this difference. Maybe this this is a big disorder here, and then maybe the oxygen mobility to the surface to create this oxygen species are different probably because here we have a, a huge difference in the conversion. But, uh, I imagine you have a huge difference on surface specific areas as well. Yes, right? yeah. yes, okay. yes, yes. This is uh, like I, I didn't put here, but I performed the BT measurements. So this series got a bigger areas than this series. 
okay. is double. This is a, a it's like a, a eleven thousand. This is is two thousand. Okay. Thank you very much. We move. We move now to the last presentation before our break. This will be given by our PhD student Vanessa Aguilera. Vanessa, please. Uh, a sua apresentação. Okay, Vanessa, thank you very much. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vanessa Vilela, a PhD student uh, supervised by Dr. Fabio Fonseca. I'm a collaborator in Project 15. And today I'm presenting our work, uh, which is titled Lantanum Serial Based Materials for C2 Hydrocarbons Production by direct conversion of methane in electrochemical device. Uh, as we know, uh, petrochemicals are everywhere and uh, their demand is still increasing, as well the world oil demand. So ethylene is the most important raw material of this industry. Uh, this, uh, sorry, it's... Um, Its application includes the, the production of plastics, petrochemical intermediates, solvents, paints, cosmetics, and its production is commonly carried out by steam cracking uh, of naphtha, which is removed from crude oil. But in the actual scenario, uh, the scientific community is searching for new roads of production of these hydrocarbons as the direct, methan, direct conversion of methane into C2 hydrocarbons. Uh, and one road that's receiving some attention is the oxidative coupling of methane reaction. Uh, this is a reaction that involves two general steps. The first one is the formation of the methyl radical by the cleavage of the CH bond. And the second step is the coupling of this, this radical forming ethylene and ethane. And the biggest, the biggest challenge of OCM process is the dif difficult activation of methane due to its high stability, which requires uh, high operational temperatures uh, that leads to, that favors the total oxidation of methane, uh, the products, uh, also, the forming of uh, oxid oxidation parallel products as CO, CO2, uh, increase the risk of explosion with the co feed of methane and oxygen mixture. And all of them uh, decrease the situ selectivity of this process. And when we think about uh, large process, large scale, scale process and economical and commercial uh, viability, we need to answer the question that is how to make this process viable. And one approach that's, that's uh, coming up is the elect electrification of OCM, uh, which we can use a solid oxide fuel cell as a solid state membrane reactor to develop the OCM in the anode uh, electrode in the fuel side. Um, and using ISOFC to develop the OCM process, uh, we can uh, 
uh, have a better control of the reactant supply, supply more active species, uh, the use of green electrons, co-generate electricity and C2 products, and it's a, a device that is a single unit for gas separation and uh, the reaction. Uh, and um, SOFC is composed by three parts. The first one is a dense electrolyte based in an oxide of zirconium. The cathode uh, based in a mixed oxide of lanthanum strontium and manganese, and an anode that is, that is based in a composite of nickel and zirconium. So the nickel present in the, the anode uh, leads to favors the, the carbon deposition, which, uh, which, is, which favors the deactivation the, the of the electrode surface and uh, decrease the efficiency of this dispositive. So we need to modify the, the, the anode. And a promising strategy is the addition of a catalytic layer, which, is the, which uh, will be compatible with the target reaction. And we will lead to the to improve the efficiency of this dispositive. So an efficient catalyst for oxidative coupling of methane is that one that have uh, alkalinity and principal the selective mobile oxygen sites. Uh, some studies reported that uh, lanthanum serial based uh, oxides uh, uh, reported show a uh, good, good perform in OCM as LCO, which uh, is represented by this chemical formula. And adding some dopants like calcium and magnesium increase the surface de defects and the oxygen amount, uh, the oxygen vacancies amount and overall alkalinity of these materials. So which will lead to uh, higher select C2 selectivities. Uh, our materials were prepared by combustion method. Uh, we use urea as fuel. And the first step was dissolving the, the nitrate and urea in water uh, in, under constant stirring and heating. Uh, the gel was taken to a muffle. Sorry, the video isn't working. Ah, Vanessa, aqui, Miguel, você me ouve? Yes. Okay, so I think you can go on. Your sound is back. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay, so let's back. Um, the gel formed in this step uh, was taken to a muffle at 500 degrees uh, the, to start the combustion reaction. You can see here. But, and after the material obtained was deagglomerated using an agate mortar and the powders obtained were characterized. In addition to LCO, we prepared three groups of samples. The first one was uh, calcium replacing lanthanum. The second one, calcium replacing cerium. And the third one, uh, magnesium uh, replacing lanthanum. So for LCO, we obtain in a single phase uh, sample with a fluoride, so a fluoride structure, uh, crystalline structure. And this sample presents uh, excellent thermal stability by seeing the uh, thermal gravimetrical curves 
there was no uh, significantly wave loss and we could detect the presence of oxygen vacancies by Raman inspector. The, the two bands, A1G and VO band, are related to these uh, vacancies. And the band F2G uh, referred to the fluoride structure. And the powder uh, show a porous sponge-like particles with irregular shape. This is our setup for the catalytic tests uh, of OCM reaction. We have a gas mixer, the, the gas, the, the feed gas uh, flows through the quartz reactor that's inside the furnace. This is the furnace. And the outlet gases were analyzed uh, by online GC EMS to, and this is our preliminary results for the catholic uh, tests. We fixed the temperature in 750 Celsius degrees, uh, four hours of reaction, and we test three different uh, methane and oxygen uh, ratios, 2-1, 4-1, and 6-1. In all tests, LCO was stable during the four hours of reaction. Uh, the formation of ethylene was favored comparing to ethane by seeing the, in this graph. Uh, the highest C2 selectivity was achieved for the composition riches in methane, uh, the 6, four, six to one uh, ratio. And lower methane conversions were shown to favor the formation of C2 hydrocarbons. The the ratio two, two to one uh, was the one who, uh, which presents the higher value for methane conversion, but the selectivity and yield were the, the lower ones. So this is our first group of samples. Oops. Uh, we obtained solid solutions with unit cell compression for calcium, substituting uh, lanthanum. Uh, it was found a fluoride type crystalline structure for the samples. And we could detect by Raman spectres the presence of oxygen vacancies and also active surface of oxygen species. And an additional band uh, related to carbonate groups, uh, which can be explained by the interaction of this material surface with the carbon dioxide present in our atmosphere. And in uh, impedance spectra, we could see a slight increase of the conductivity with calcium addition. In the three different uh, atmosphere of analysis, the inert atmosphere, oxidant, and reducing. Um, we tested the sample with uh, the higher amounts of calcium in LCO lattice. And we found that the addition of calcium favored the, the C2 selectivity when compared to LCO. Uh, the, the value of conversion of methane was almost the same, practically the same, and the selectivity almost doubled. This is our second group of samples. We, that, that one who, where calcium is substituting cerium. And we also obtained solid solutions, but with a unit cell expansion and a mixture of phases, a fluoride phase and C-type superstructure phase. The C-type superstructure, uh, we could see this band formation in Raman spectra and also see the presence of oxygen vacancies in active surface oxygen species that could favor the OCM reactions. And in the impedance spectrum, we could see a slight decrease of the conductivity in the three different uh, atmospheres of analysis. And this is our three uh, third uh, group of, an, of samples. Uh, we also saw, we also reached 
uh, solve the solution uh, with unit cell compression. Uh, we detected the presence of oxygen vacancies and active surface vacancies, sorry, surface oxygen species, and also uh, the porous like uh, particles. In parallel to heterogeneous catalytic tests, we are producing our single cells. Uh, the first step is uh, fabricate the electrolyte uh, based in zirconia oxide by tape casting, uh, tape casting method. The anode and the cathode are deposited by airbrush. And after that, uh, we deposit the catalytic layer also using the, the airbrush. And we hope uh, test very soon the, these modified cells in the SOFC test station, develop the OCM reaction in this station. And that's it. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Vanessa. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, the session is open for some questions and comments before the break. I make questions for her every week, so don't be yes. fair. So, Andrea. Oh, uh, very nice talk, Vanessa. Uh, what's the idea for the first, uh, like, a device that you plan to, to use for us, OCM is the, the as a catalytic layer. Can do you do like how thick and how do you how do you think you can avoid the, the oxidation by the nickel? I think that that's very important, right? Yes, we. Uh, I'm 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 uh, doing some different pressures of. Uh, thickness of the, the catalytic layer. And based, I, I'm trying to base my uh, thickness in the results of uh, the catalytic uh, tests, the residual time, residual time, and the, the mass that is Vivian will test in next week. What's, what's the anode? It's zirconia with nickel? Yes. And then you put on the top? Yes. The catalytic layer. Okay. Yes. Now, I have a tricky one. <laughs> oh, Fabio. <laughs> Do you think the water, when you're running a fuel cell, you produce water? Yes. I mean, a solid oxide fuel cell, oxygen ion conducting fuel cell, you're going to produce water on the anode side. Uh, do you think it might play a role in your catalysis? Yeah. Very tricky, huh? Yeah. It's also a good test for <laughs> for the catalytic test bench. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank, thank you. you all. We we have a um, we, we resume at ten thirty, so we have uh, close to ten minutes break. Um, thank you very much. We resume at 10.30. Thank you very much. 11.30, I'm sorry, 11.30.
esto. Hi, Fernando, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, it's, uh, it's working quite well. I'm sorry again. No problem. <laughs> okay. Now you are in, you are like uh, a lecturer. Um, no, the name is panelist. You are a panelist now. Okay. No, oh, fine. <laughs> Let me go ahead. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Fine, good, good. Go ahead and see if I can uh, present my screen. Fernando, I will stop my video and my microphone, but I'm here. Just call me, okay? Okay. If you need. Okay. okay. Good morning, Fernando. Good morning. How was the sound? Uh, good, just good. Good to hear you. <laughs> it's a, the miracle of, it's the miracle of Zoom. It's the miracle of Zoom. I I hope we can resume our normal life without miracles and 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 eventually have you here personally as uh, soon as we, we can manage. I would, um, I would appreciate that also. So, okay, I think it's time to, to move on. If you're ready, uh, we're gonna we're gonna start the session. This is our last session of our fifth workshop of the methane to products of program of CINI. And uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to have here today, Professor Fernando Garçon. Um, which was kind enough to accept our invitation in his busy, busy schedule right now at this point at the university. I will make a short introduction to, to Professor Fernando Garçon. He holds a, um, a position at University of New Mexico, Mexico as a distinguished professor of the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and a faculty research scientist at Sandia, Zandia National Labs. Um, Professor Fernando Garçon, there has his research interests include basically electrochemistry in a broad sense and material science. He has been the author of more than 200 papers with more than 12,000 citations. He has been serving the Electrochemical Society for many years. He has held several positions as a vice president, president of the Electrochemical Society. He also holds several patents in electrochemical technology. And he's been also in contact with us through the CSTAR and CINI center to center collaboration that we started um, now. Um, now, I mean, in, in the last months, a couple of months ago. So today it, it's, uh, uh, we, we have the opportunity to share a little bit our research and data um, on this topic of methane conversion on, on electrochemical devices. So, Professor Fernando Gasson, thank you very much again. Well, thank you for the kind, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-workers, my doctoral student, uh, Luke uh, de Neuer, and uh, my and one of the members of my research faculty, uh, Professor uh, Kanan uh, Ramayan, 
And uh, I'm also the director for the Center for Microengineered Materials at UNM. And I just have included a couple of slides uh, about our center. So we have a center located, actually co-located with members of the Advanced Manufacturing and uh, Ceramic Engineering Group of Sandia National Laboratory. And so we have a relatively, uh, our center uh, is uh, relatively large. We have uh, a number of people who are involved in the theoretical modeling and analysis of materials. We also have uh, quite a large uh, uh, faculty which are associated with the experimental work. And uh, we also have an advanced characterization staff, which these are the people who maintain all of those expensive pieces of equipment, uh, which are so uh, important for our work. And of course, we have a center support staff, which, is, uh, which uh, keeps everything uh, running. Our research expenditures run from approximately three to five million dollars uh, per year. This does not include faculty uh, salaries and our, uh, that's US dollars. And our publications are, we, are, we publish approximately 50 to 70 uh, peer reviewed publications per year. The, uh, the mission really of our center is to provide the focal point for the uh, collaborations, the interdisciplinary uh, materials research uh, for the development and education of, uh, of students and new uh, faculty member. We manage the core facilities for a number of the core facilities for University of New Mexico, which include everything from uh, very uh, atomic resolution, the scanning uh, transmission electron microscopy. We just received a Joel NeoArm microscope, high resolution uh, transmission electron microscopy, uh, dual beam, uh, focused ion beam, scanning electron microscopy, SEM EDAX, X-ray diffraction, XPS, uh, X-ray fluorescence, scanning X-ray fluorescence microscopy, scanning my Raman microscopy, FTIR, uh, a number of thermal analysis systems and uh, gas uh, uh, pore size characterization equipment, uh, gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, uh, we have a high temperature materials processing lab, ceramic editing manufacturing facilities, and we, uh, we do quite a bit of fuel cell, battery, and electrochemical testing and characterization. So uh, a, an important question is, why are we even bothering to try and do electrochemical conversion of methane? And as you, as you probably are all aware of, methane is the largest component of natural gas in, in general. We've been focusing on shale gas as we have large shale gas reserves within the United States. The, the grand challenge is really how do we partially oxidize methane without significantly converting most of it to carbon monoxide and, or carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and water. Uh, oxygen is a cheap and very abundant oxidant. There's a number of cycles which use either uh, sulfur or halogens, which can avoid the, uh, the, the oxidation penalties using oxygen. However, they're far more expensive. And the big problem as we, as we will see is, is, is that oxygen gas is too aggressive at the correct stoichio stoichiometric ratios to provide very high selectivity for C2 hydrocarbons, at least on most of the known catalysts. And there is work going on in CSTAR at finding catalysts which can promote the, the formation of, of C2 and higher hydrocarbons from methane without such problems. A way of, uh, of affecting the uh, oxidizing potential of, of, of oxygen is to use electrochemistry. And this is what we really are focusing on here. It also has the uh, potential application to co-generate electrical power. And uh, we are involved in the larger sea star processes of converting methane to higher hydrocarbons. And what we've found is, is, is that 
The uh, electrochemical approaches which we are using uh, primarily uh, promote the formation of uh, ethylene, ethene, rather than ethane, which is quite, quite interesting. And so uh, methane activation is our, is our main goal. And uh, ethylene is a very important feedstock for the chemical and fuel uh, industries. It gives us the ability to synthesize many uh, uh, longer chain uh, hydrocarbons. So the, uh, let me, uh, so let's look a little bit about methane oxidation thermodynamics. Oxygen gas, as I mentioned before, is a very uh, aggressive oxidant and it favors complete oxidation if there's enough oxygen available to carbon dioxide in water and uh, not plotted here. Also, carbon monoxide and hydrogen uh, if you limit the oxygen stoichiometry. But the reaction free energies are, are extremely high for the oxidation of methane, which is why it makes such a good uh, fuel. We would like to limit the uh, formation, the uh, oxidation reaction to the blue line here, where you see the, it's a production uh, primarily of uh, ethylene. There is a possibility to also limit the, uh, to also create uh, ethane, but experimentally we're seeing most of our conversion is going to, is going to ethylene. So this is a tremendous challenge as this reaction really wants to go uh, much uh, further downhill in the, uh, for the more exothermic reactions. So how do we do this? So uh, one wet method of controlling the, uh, the oxidizing power of oxygen is to use oxide ion uh, electrolyte cells. And so what I have illustrated here is something which many of you are probably familiar with. It's used in solid oxide fuel cells. If you take a zirconia uh, oxide lattice, and if you take this lattice and you add a cation of lower charge, such as, uh, such as uh, yttrium, uh, calcium, uh, there are others which you can add uh, to here. You, what you do is, is you create oxygen vacancies. And it's the high mobility of these oxygen vacancies which, uh, which allows for oxide ion transport within this system. And so this gives us the opportunity to produce electrochemical cells where you're reacting the fuel with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the oxide ion to produce your product, your desired product, plus, uh, plus all electrical energy if the reaction goes downhill from a thermodynamic perspective. And on your counter uh, electrode, you're going to be uh, producing a new oxide ions uh, through the interaction of oxygen gas vacancies and electron transfer. And in most uh, electrochemical cells, which are producing power, you have a theoretical cell voltage, which corresponds to the complete electro-oxidation of the fuel. But uh, in practice, we always have uh, losses. And these losses are activation losses, which are, which are due to, uh, which are related to the tra charge transfer mechanisms. In uh, many cases, uh, multiple electrons need to be transferred in order for the oxidation reaction to occur and uh, there's uh, losses associated with that. We have the resistive losses due to tra ionic transport through the solid electrolyte and also through electronic transport through the anode cathode materials and uh, our, uh, the wires within our circ circuitry. And finally, you can in some circumstances get mass uh, transport losses due to diffusional losses through these layers. However, those can fortunately be minimized. Some of the electrolytes uh, which we use in our experimental studies include yttria-stabilized zirconia, which we've illustrated here. Uh, the, uh, another one is a cerium gallium oxide, another fluorite structured oxide where gallium substitutes for cerium, which has much higher conductivity, but it also promotes a, uh, oxidative reactions on 
the surface with a catalyst. The other one is the lanthanum, strontium, gallium, magnesium oxides, which are perovskite structured materials, which offer high, relatively high oxide ion uh, conductivities, uh, it, higher than nutrient stabilized zirconia, but uh, unfortunately, and we do use these in our cells, but the mechanical properties such as the flexure modulus are not as good as yttria stabilized zirconia. We are very fortunate that yttria stabilized zirconia is not just a good ionic conductor, it's a very strong structural material, which facilitates the making of these cells and the operation of these cells. So the, uh, it's important to select electrocatalysts which are stable under the very chemically reducing conditions which uh, the oxidative coupling of methane occurs. And this is being, uh, unfortunately, it's often overlooked in the, in the literature. There are a number of metal catalysts, which of course would be stable under reducing conditions. However, unfortunately, they tend to promote complete oxidation of methane to the lowest thermodynamic state, whether it's uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen or CO2 and water. On the other hand, uh, there's been a lot of research which has been done on metal oxide catalysts, perovskite, structured fluorite, spinels, and these show higher degrees of selectivity in some cases. However, stability because they are oxides is a, is a major issue. All oxides have some tendency to reduce, and this is something which can be represented well in an Ellingham diagram. This is a thermodynamic diagram which metallurgists and ceramicists use to assess the stability of uh, different oxides. Here we have simple oxides plotted, what the free energy per mole of oxygen is on this uh, axis. And on the uh, bottom axis, we have our temperature scale. And on the right-hand scale here, we have what the effective oxygen partial pressure this corresponds to. So one can draw lines which correspond to constant oxygen activity or partial pressures of oxygen for these various reactions. Your, your oxides, which are most uh, resistant to, uh, to uh, reduction to metals, which is the reverse reaction, are listed down here. And as you can see that the reduction of uh, zirconium to zirconium metal uh, is a, would be a very uh, endothermic process as the formation is very exothermic. And you can see the same for uh, magnesium oxide, which has been uh, studied extensively as a heterogeneous uh, catalyst for the, uh, for the oxidative coupling of, of uh, methane. You can, unfortunately, some of the more interesting oxides, which are reported in the literature, tend to contain contain uh, iron oxide species, cobalt oxide species, nickel, copper, which are more susceptible to, to uh, reduction. Now, these, are, these diagrams here are for the, the basic binary oxides. When they are within uh, perovskite, fluorite, and spinel structures, many times there's additional stability against reduction due to the influence of the other cations within the lattice. But that, this can only go so far, uh, unfortunately. So we need to work uh, within these constraints, particularly at high temperatures where thermodynamics tends to dominate the stability of the materials. Now, many, uh, there's been many perovskite oxides studied uh, for, uh, for the uh, oxi oxidation of methane. And the perovskites are a very interesting structure. We like to think of them as almost as the uh, silicon analogy in that, that by substitution, doping of these uh, of the A or B cations, which are represented here, uh, which are octahedrally coordinated by, by oxygen. You can change the properties of these. They can be made into electronic conductors, ionic conductors and their catalytic properties can be very tremendously. Uh, the, uh, this is a, a, a summary of some of the, of some of the 
perovskite catalysts, which have been investigated for the uh, partial oxidation of methane. And uh, the X represents here the, uh, what the uh, conversion, uh, the molar conversion is in percent and the selectivity for hydrogen and CO. And you can see here that most of these catalysts are highly selective to uh, the partial oxidation of methane to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So in investigating uh, perovskite catalysts for C2 conversion, of course, we want to uh, minimize this reaction uh, to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And uh, if you, if you study the literature, you'll see that, unfortunately, many of the very active catalysts like lanthanum strontium iron oxide, which have also been used in fuel cells and as, and as oxidation catalysts for complete oxidation of hydrocarbons, are extremely uh, uh, selective for those, for those reactions. The, uh, another reaction which we have to consider, which is very uh, Im important to study is uh, the reaction of CO2 with our materials as, we're, as we will inevitably be producing some CO2 byproducts. And unfortunately, CO2 is very reactive with uh, barium, strontium, calcium, magnesium, the alkaline earths. And uh, so there's a, there will always be a tendency to try to form carbonates on the surface of perovskites, which have been uh, doped with these. And these are the most common dopants on, uh, for these, for the perovskites. So the barium, strontium, calcium, magnesium. And you can see here, fortunately, the, uh, uh, many of the, the catalytically active metal oxides, such as iron and cobalt, uh, their, their tendency to form carbonates is relatively weak. Unfortunately, their tendency to be reduced to metals is, is substantially stronger. So these are some of the con constraints which we have to work with. And we oftentimes see the formation of these carbonates on the surface of perovskite catalysts. So just a little bit about how we go about uh, making these, uh, these cells and materials. This is we use uh, additive manufacturing, ceramic extrusion uh, techniques. We have to develop the, uh, the powders and the suspension vehicles. We use direct write techniques in order to write, in order to create electrolytes the, and the electrode materials. And we've done these uh, this is a versatile technique for producing uh, cells for the, uh, a number of, uh, of different uh, electrosynthesis and uh, fuel cell applications. It has the advantage uh, of rapid prototyping for industrial manufacturing. You probably would not use this, but for rapid prototyping, it's quite nice. We, uh, we have uh, printed successfully to stabilize and gadolinium uh, uh, doped cerium oxides as electrolyte materials, platinum group metals, many perovskites, and, many, and a number of metal carbides as, as catalysts. So the, some traditional ways of actually measuring the stability of your electrocatalysts against reduction uh, include uh, thermogravimetric analysis, where you're looking at weight changes in the relative atmospheres and you scan the temperature. It's a, very, it's a very powerful technique, but it's not very fast, unfortunately. It takes a very long time to determine what the stability limits are in different gas atmospheres using, using this technique. So a number of years back, I developed a technique of thin film DC voltammetry, high temperature voltammetry as a rapid method because it, uh, it eliminates the slow reaction step of the gas solid surface exchange rates and the long, uh, long range diffusion problems. So you can uh, obtain stability to reduction much faster. And I have just a few examples here of some of the things which we did, which we've done. So the basic way which you do this is, is that you create a thin film of your oxide material of choice and you deposit it on a stable, on uh, a thermodynamically stable uh, electrolyte. 
You can use sputtering, evaporation, laser deposition, you can spin on CBD or print, as I showed before. You then need to conduct, uh, overcoat uh, the material with an oxygen blocking layer so that no diffusion of oxygen can occur through the surface. And uh, gold we use in most of our experiments, a thin film of gold. And uh, then we use a porous platinum oxygen counter electrode. We operate the, the counter and reference electrodes at fixed oxygen partial pressures as a reference. So we reference to oxygen, uh, the chemical potential of oxygen in air at those uh, at the relevant temperature. We control the electrode potential with a potentiostat, and we can measure the stoichiometry changes, decomposition potentials, and kinetics. Um, and we can relate these to the Ellingham diagrams, which we saw before, by the familiar Nernst relationship that the electro, that the uh, cell voltage, if your cell is designed properly, is related to the ratio of the oxygen of the effective oxygen partial pressure at the experimental interface divided by the oxygen potential at the uh, at the reference electrode. So this is just a, a schematic diagram of the setup. So you have your, uh, your gold oxygen blocking uh, electrode in atmosphere with a low concentration of oxygen, your metal thin film of analysis, your solid electrolyte, your oxygen reference side here with reference with a counter electrode and reference uh, electrodes. And we can sweep in one direction if it's an irreversible process, or we can continue to cycle the potential of time to look at the behavior. So over here, I'm showing what the, what the stability is for a partially stabilized uh, zirconia, which we use uh, extensively in our experiments. And what we can see here is, is that as we increase the temperature, the current is, is very modest. It's very low until at 800 degrees here, you can see that you're actually starting to reduce the zirconia. So that gives us, that gives us the limit really of how far we can sweep in polarization and negative polarization voltage from uh, basically uh, air equilibrium to what corresponds to very reducing potentials. And as you can see, the stability is a function of temperature where the hotter you go, of course, the stability decreases. Now, you can do this also for Syria, which is, of course, extensively studied uh, in, as, a, as a catalyst support. And Syria, it shows very complex behavior. You can see that on the top scale here, this is the effective oxygen partial pressure, and this is your polarization voltage here, that you have many peaks which correspond to the reduction of cerium, of cerium oxide to lower valent uh, cerium oxide structures here, but this process is quite reversible. We can sweep back and forth and reoxidize the material. And this is one of the reasons why it, it works so well in car catalytic converters because it can store oxygen reversibly. And so in this case, we're reducing the cerium oxide. In this case, we're electrochemically reoxidizing this. And we can do this for many, many, many cycles. But again, the stability of the material is uh, against reduction is less than atriostabilized zirconia. Uh, here's an example of one of the catalysts, which was listed on the list before, the lanthanum uh, manganite, which uh, is uh, at 800 degrees. We, if we sweep here to more and more reducing conditions, we can see a sudden reduction of the material. And by counting the charge here, we can determine that uh, this material has been reduced and this uh, agrees very well from what was seen from thermogravimetric analysis studies that were re reducing the material to lanthanum oxide and mang uh, manganese monoxide. And uh, on subsequent attempts to reoxidize this, we can see that the kinetics for reoxidation are very slow. If we do the same thing at different temperatures. We can see the temperature dependence of these in different cells. And so we can rapidly uh, assess the stability of the material. Uh, there is a first reduction peak, which corresponds to this oxygen three plus X, which is, which is quite reversible. And we can 
show here that we can scan back and forth and see the, uh, ox the reduction in reoxidation of the lanthanum uh, uh, manganite uh, back and forth by, by cycling. So it can measure the non-stoichiometry and show the reversibility of the kinetics. Here, when we dope at strontium to improve the electronic conductivity and the catalytic activity, we can see that we have reduced the stability of the material. It starts reducing at a lower effective oxygen partial pressure. So these techniques are quite valuable. Here's another one for lanthanum cobalt oxide, where we can see that it's, a, it's an excellent oxidation catalyst, but unfortunately it's not very stable even at, uh, even at modest uh, effective oxygen partial pressures, we, we get irreversible reduction of this. Now, in the development of our electrochemical reactors, it requires uh, printing of these, the, the development of cells here. This is just an example of the typical type of spring-loaded cell, which we use here, which goes into our high temperature uh, furnace in order to investigate uh, these small 20 millimeter cells, which we typically use. The, if we look at the, the mass spectroscopy of the lanthanum strontium manganite, which we did before, what we saw was, this is the heterogeneous catalysis. We now have a mass spectrometer hooked up to our system. We can look at our methane conversion versus time and temperature, but the conversion was, uh, was to either CO2 and water or CO and, uh, and hydrogen, depending on the oxygen concentration. We look at our electrochemical characterization of this, what we see is that as we sweep this, and you can see here that there's a zero here, and the zero current corresponds to whether the system's producing current in this direction or whether we're having to actually supply current. And what we see here is, is, is that on the first few cycles, there is activity, but as we cycle back and forth, the material is eventually, is eventually reduced in uh, methane environments, in hydrogen environments, we also get uh, reduction and it doesn't recover. So it loses its catalytic properties towards methane activation after a day of operation. Now in 2019, uh, a uh, Chinese group uh, published a paper which caused quite a stir uh, showing very efficient electrochemical uh, conversion of methane to ethylene in a solid oxide uh, electrolyzer. And uh, they showed high selectivities using a strontium iron uh, mang uh, manganese oxide catalyst, which uh, is abbreviated as SFMO here. And so we decided to investigate this because of the, uh, again, at the right polarization, they were showing high degrees of of C2 uh, selectivity. Now, one thing which was, uh, which was to us a cautionary thing is, is they said that they had to supply electrical energy for this process, which should not be necessary as this oxidation process is exothermic. It should actually be producing electricity rather than them having to apply uh, voltages. And you can see these potentials are very high potentials. These are very oxidizing potentials, and they are referenced against against air. Again, these are very negative. These are very uh, oxidizing positive potentials, which they had to apply to the system. So, what uh, we did is, is we uh, synthesized these strontium iron manganese oxide uh, catalysts. Uh, the designation here is this is 0.75 iron substitution in in this in this here and first did the uh, temperature programmed uh, reaction heterogeneous studies and what we observed is, is is that as we ramped our uh, temperature and looked at our relative concentration of our product gases we did see some conversion to uh, to uh, ethylene at uh, at uh, at some temperatures and also some CO production depending on the temperature. So what we also saw though is, is that our catalyst was gaining weight indicating that we probably were also coking the, the catalyst, which, which is typical 
uh, a typical response of what you saw. And this is for different concentrations of oxygen here and uh, zero oxygen, 5% oxygen and 10% oxygen. So we uh, wanted to uh, study this in a similar fashion to uh, what the, uh, the previous group uh, did. These are some illustrations of our cells, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, showing just our, our small button cells with our active areas. You can see here the Coke formation here that's turning black here after experiments. But what we did find is, is that at the appropriate potentials and negative potentials and the open circuit potential of this, which is essentially running this thing in fuel cell mode was about minus 1.1, minus 1.2 volts. What, uh, what we see here is, is, is that there is ethylene production. And if you select the appropriate, uh, the, the appropriate uh, potential, you control the potential at so that the, that the system is not as oxidizing as it would be here, what you get is, is uh, an increase in the relative concentration of ethylene at those given applied potentials. And as we go to more and more oxidizing conditions, what we see here is, is, is that the relative concentration of, of uh, ethylene drops over over time and the concentration of water, water is, is increasing here too. So this is, uh, it is an, an effective uh, oxidation catalyst. However, we have to consider the stability of this material. Now, we also studied multiple cycles of this and within this potential range here, where the material is gives us the, the best production here. And so by cycling the potential back and forth, we measure the current response of the system. We look at the water, CO2, eth, uh, ethylene, and hydrogen production. And we can see that these peak at different potentials also. The, uh, and the peak, uh, you can see here that there are peak uh, that there are peaks within these different processes for the production of the different species. And this is where the peak is for the ethylene production. So we, we see ethylene and hydrogen production shows two peaks for every potential cycling between minus uh, one and minus 0 0.5 volts, indicating that the bias is having a role uh, in terms of the, the, the production. Now, if we look at some of the physical char characterization of these materials, what we see is, is, is that in air, the material is quite, uh, is quite st stable, only about a 2% weight loss as we scan up to 900 degrees C. However, if we look at the weight change here in methane, we see that 40, 60% weight gain, again, related, uh, could be related to coke formation, but when we perform the uh, X-ray X diffraction analysis of our materials which have been exposed to, uh, to methane, we see a complete loss of the perovskite structure forming strontium carbonate uh, and uh, other, other uh, species here. The, uh, the starting material looks great under these conditions, but we get unfortunately this decomposition. Some other physical characterization of these materials include the uh, XBS characterization of these materials where we see the strong formation, the strontium uh, carbonate uh, in the presence of, uh, of methane. And uh, we also see shifts in the molybdenum oxidation state, which uh, agrees with the diffraction, which we saw. So if you look at the stability of the binary oxides, Again, the, the, the strong, uh, you are fighting the, for, the Gibbs uh, free energy of formation of the carbonates uh, against the, these, these negative reactions here forming also the strontium uh, molybdate uh, phases. And so this is driving the decomposition of this material. So unfortunately, this material is not thermodynamically stable for the desired reactions. 
So the, uh, we explored a number of materials which we, which we hope to see higher stability by working with perovskites, which contain niobium, which is a highly refractory oxide. It's very resistant to oxidation and it's not a strong carbonate form, former. What we found was is, is that these uh, barium magnesium niobate family, uh, it's actually the barium niobate family of catalysts, iron, which are iron doped, showed excellent stability to uh, reduction. These were used previously uh, by, uh, by Professor uh, uh, Thangadurai's group in Canada for CO2 sensors in, in high temperature environments. And uh, they reported very high chemical stability. So we said, well, let's have a look at these as catalysts. We prepared these with different iron doping uh, ratios within the material. They all maintain the perovskite structure. And uh, we performed uh, first, uh, the, uh, we uh, estimate, we did some experiments looking at the chemical stability in uh, different uh, environments, in air environments and methane environments. We saw very small weight changes of the sample, which was a very good sign. And very little changes in the x-ray diffraction patterns of the materials. One thing which we did observe is, is, is that we were reaching probably the solubility limit for iron in the structure because we started to see second phases, uh, iron containing second phases when we went to the 33% substitution here. The 25 and 17% substitutions were, were single phase perovskite materials. And uh, we'll be publishing on the uh, chemistry of the system. Uh, we're preparing a presentation now on that. We also prepared the calcium substituted rather than the, than the magnesium substituted materials. And we were able to produce materials which weren't as single phase as we could produce with the, with the uh, magnesium substituted materials. However, uh, this is ongoing research and we are developing uh, different subs, uh, uh, methods of synthesis in order to see if we can produce higher quality materials. If we go back to the, the, the BMNF materials, the magnesium niobium iron uh, perovskites here, what we see from temperature programmed uh, experiments is we do see some ethylene uh, production at within a given temperature range here on temperature programmed reaction studies. And this is not due to the bare tube. We looked at the, at the, uh, at the uh, system without the, the catalyst present. So the heterogeneous experiment showed some, some activity to this. We didn't see any weight change due to coking on these materials. Uh, if we performed, again, this is the the ethylene production was higher than CO, though we did see CO2 uh, contributions uh, at the, which was sig very significant at the higher concentrations at, within a 10% oxygen environment. So we did some electrochemical characterization on these systems. For it to be a electrocatalyst, it has to have electronic conductivity and the electronic conductivity of this material is relatively modest compared to some of the other perovskites, which we saw, measuring the, the total conductivity of these, of these materials. XBS characterization showed that uh, about 50% of the oxygen sites were uh, associated with neighboring vacancies, which was further increased by iron doping. The, these uh, barium uh, magnesium niobate perovskites uh, have very little niobium in the five plus state. And this increased when we dope with iron. So the, the, the chemistry of these systems is quite interesting. Cyclic voltammetry was, uh, was relatively stable. Uh, if you compare the, the uh, BMNF25 versus SFMO here, you can see very stable cyclic voltammetry over a very wide potential range. And again, this is where we cross the, this is where you cross between having to add uh, current to the system rather than, than the cells actually producing, producing electrical energy here. And we saw peaks at 
0.21, 1.1, and 0.76 uh, volts. So we investigated the activation behavior within there by uh, cycling potential uh, and uh, current, uh, watching the measuring the current response, and we saw uh, ethylene production here, hydrogen, water, and CO2. Interestingly, we didn't see much CO production within these within these uh, cells. And this is contrasted with the behavior which we saw for the previous SFMO materials. Now, the electrochemical stability was, uh, was quite good. We've, uh, we've exceeded now six days of continuous operation. And so the catalyst appears to be quite stable. We've exposed it to, uh, to uh, hydrogen, which we believe was removing small amounts of carbon, which we're depositing in the electrodes. And so uh, this is uh, a material which we are uh, studying. Now you can see here, the current densities are relatively modest here. We have relatively low uh, surface areas of these materials as compared to the strontium iron uh, uh, manganate uh, materials, uh, which we previously uh, produce, which we previously investigated. And so we're looking at ways to increase the uh, electronic conductivity and decrease the particle size of these materials. And you can say, again, very nice stability over time with these as we continue the cycles. So uh, to summarize, we think, we believe that these, these uh, barium niobate parent structure materials are very interesting in that they're showing remarkable chemical stability, despite the fact that barium is relatively reactive, is highly reactive to CO2. Barium oxides are, are containing materials uh, are reactive to CO2. We're trying to understand why this is the case. The chemical stability of the structure may be coming, may be due to the niobium 4 5 stabilization or from poor oxide ion mobility within the material. The OCM measurements on the, these catalysts show good catalytic activity, but we need to compare these to other benchmarks. And uh, most importantly, we need to greatly change the surface area of our materials and prepare better electrode structures. We are working with materials which are only between one to 10 meters squared per gram when we were working previously before with factors of 10 times higher surface area for the previous materials which we studied. So this is an ongoing uh, project, but uh, we think it's uh, uh, of quite a bit of interest. So with that, I believe I've taken up enough time really for this, this talk. Uh, I am very happy to uh, receive questions and uh, to also uh, communicate with any of the CINE uh, researchers uh, uh, through uh, email, Zoom communications uh, at, at any point. I look forward to the C2C collaborations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando Gasson, for this brilliant presentation. It was very interesting to see um, the very effective electrochemistry, solid state electrochemistry going on over there, getting all those voltammetry profiles and, and, and nice measurements at high temperature to elucidate, find out where we have, whether we have stability or not in different oxides uh, aiming at the OCM electrochemical conversion. Um, I would like to open the session for questions. I would like to know, have any questions coming from here, the audience or, or from the online audience as well? Um, I, I have a quick one, Fernando. Uh, I don't know if I've missed that. As far as I remember from, from the nature paper that you've mentioned, the, the perovskite. So one of the key features over there was having those iron exsolved nanoparticles as uh, the, the idea of having those iron exsolved nanoparticles which have like a big interaction between the perovskite structure and 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 the metallic particle. I, I would like to to ask. I, I I don't know if I missed that. If you perform any previous exolution of your materials, or if you just like in situ 
during the reduction steps. I don't know if you, if you took that into account in your experiments. Yeah, that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting question. We did not do the, we did not do the, uh, the exolving. We found that it was not necessary. We did reduce some of our samples and looked at the behavior and we found that it really did not impact the behavior of the, of the, uh, of the catalysis. And uh, I actually have, a, a, just in case that, that some of those questions were asked about this catalyst, we did do some uh, deliberate studies where we actually added uh, iron using incipient wetness to the surfaces of our catalysts to see how this would, would change the, the behavior. And we did a similar, uh, similar types of experiments with the SFMO catalysts. And we found that it just, it actually favored more complete uh, conversion of, and decreased actually the ethylene uh, yields in contrast to the, uh, to the, the zoo reports. The zoo reports were very, uh, we had a difficult time understanding them because they had to go to very oxidizing uh, potentials, applied potentials in order to get any activity within their systems. And uh, this puzzled us tremendously because we said this reaction should be, uh, should be occurring uh, somewhere between the open circuit potential and uh, somewhere between the uh, zero referencing against, uh, against air or, or oxygen. They had to apply potentials which were even more oxidizing than, uh, than air in order to get their, uh, their conversion. Yes, indeed. Uh, I got the same, the same feeling reading this paper. We, we, we took a while to figure out whether it was like a fuel cell or electrolyzer. Well, so this was like extremely high potentials in order to see the effects that they reported there. But anyway, uh, on the other hand, you've showed here a very nice niobate phase, which shows a very promising stability. Um, my question is whether your conductivity it's it's basically so you showed the conductivity results and and you mentioned the the surface area increase so as a way of improving yes I'm, I'm, this is the conflict here that I'd like to to hear a little bit of your thoughts on it's there's a the the difficulty of having a, a high electronic conductivity and and on those oxides and catalytic activity would you Oh yes, and, and stability also also plays exactly. into the factor. So generally, when we increase the electronic conductivity, we decrease the stability. That's what I've been saying for years uh, within these within these. So there is a there is a trade off within those. And so we're investigating uh, some substitutions to improve the electronic conductivity and seeing what the impact will be on uh, on the stability through substitutions. Uh, for uh, for niobium with these within the systems, we we have some preliminary data that the calcium ones have higher conductivity. We we're not sure that rather than using magnesium, using calcium, we're not sure why this is the case, and uh, we need to do a number of experiments uh, to uh, confirm this. The uh, what we're what we are seeing also too here on the right hand side here is this. Is this this addition of extra iron is, uh, is also improving <laughs> the conductivity, but uh, we, we believe that we're very close to, to the solubility limit is between, for iron in this compound, it's between the 0.25 to the 0.33 substitution. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Then we're not sure why this is stable because the iron, we would predict that this should be very reactive to uh, decomposition by barium carbonate formation, iron reduction. But this is, a, this is a, why we need to do experimental work and not just uh, go by our theoretical predictions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Andrea here he has a question for you, Fernando, one second. Hi, Fernando. Very nice talk. I learned a lot. 
Uh, I was curious. I mean, your your uh, voltamet cyclic voltammetry experiments are very neat, very nice. I was curious. I mean, can can we think about like a process that you make a cyclic process, like like people do, like a chemical looping, but with the, like, the electrochemical potential, so you can work in nice lightly. Uh, reducing potential and then recover and go back and forth. I don't know. That's some crazy idea that I had. And I think it, oh, have you thought oh. something about? I, I don't. I don't think it's crazy. Uh, I think that it's a very good idea, particularly if you're working, uh, if you're fighting uh, coke formation within the material. It, the question is: is when you cycle, you want to be sure that you maintain the crystal structure, that you don't completely reduce the uh the crystal the 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 perovskite crystal structure whatever crystal structure you're working with and so yes and so we have done a few experiments along those sorts of lines uh to see if we could maintain the stability of this catalyst and uh it was it was not possible we always ended up with decomposing and forming these uh the, these uh, strontium carbonate and strontium molybdate uh materials here uh could you repeat that some more stable like fluoride structures maybe i don't know like serial based yeah. yeah so so we investigated a number of the the, the of the doped uh, uh seria including the to presmodymium to make them uh, electronically conductive and uh, so far we uh, we see complete oxidation. They're good oxidation catalysts for for producing CO and hydrogen or CO two and water. But uh, so we found that uh, Syria just promote. It's just such a beautiful oxidation promoter that uh, we have uh, we have uh, uh, almost given up with with uh, Syria. We thought Syria was one of the first ones which we which we used because let me go back to the cyclical temperature of Syria here, if it will enable me. Because this is beautiful behavior, and this is why it works so well in in car catalytic converters, because you can cycle back and forth between uh, between uh, uh, supplying oxygen and uh, reoxidation as the stoichiometric ratios change uh, within the catalytic converters of of cars. Uh, but it's just to it. It is so it promotes. Uh, We've tried mixing Syria with some of our perovskite catalysts, and it seems to promote complete uh, uh, oxidation of the system. But yeah. again, uh, we're finding that you need to do the experimental uh, work that uh, it's uh, our theoretical, our first principles theoretical predictions on this have not uh, been particularly accurate. All right. Thank you very much, Fernando. If you don't have any any left questions, I would like to thank you again. Let's thank again our speaker. Thank you very much for the invitation. I, I hope to catch up very soon with you and, and the other colleagues from CSTAR so we can put our collaboration plan into action uh, now that things are coming back to, to normality, hopefully. And uh, I know you're pretty busy with your end of your calendar year there, all right? So thank you very much again for joining us, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you. I'm enjoying it, this session. Bye-bye. So everyone, I thank you everyone here, all your speakers of this final morning session, people from, from joining us uh, on the Zoom miracle. <laughs> and thank you all again for the organizers, people that have helped us to put this event online and, and presential here, Gustavo Oliveira, Miguel Negro, Vivian Vasques. Thank you all for your contributions, okay? Thank you very much. See you soon again. Bye-bye. Okay.